Hey, what's up, everybody? This is John Odermatt, not Brian McWilliams. I'm coming to you on Wednesday with a special Finding Freedom, Wednesday Finding Freedom edition. And uh, the reason for that, Brian and I just did a little switcheroo of days. You'll hear from Brian tomorrow on Thursday with ELL. Um, he's traveling today, so that's why we're doing it this way. And uh, don't worry, Brian is not canceled yet. I have an incredible show coming up for you today. An awesome interview with Cyprian, a.k.a. Vin Armani. It's a, it's a long episode, and uh, as you can see, I've titled it Finding Your Fighting Position. And you got to stick with this episode. We're not going to talk about that until the last part of it, but it all kind of comes together. And I think for a lot of people, what Cyprian has been saying you know, for the past year, two years, is going to start to make sense. Um, not that it hasn't made sense already. Um, I know for me personally, though, this kind of, you know, gave me that 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 bit of uh, that of insight of clarity uh, that I that I'd been needing, quite honestly. So I'm looking forward to y'all hearing it. I just want to let you know, encourage you to subscribe to the Lions of Liberty podcast if you haven't already. Please do right now if you're on your uh, your iPhone listening on uh, Apple Podcasts. You can hit that little tiny plus sign up in the right hand corner. Just turn your fingers sideways and just squint your left eye a little bit. You should be able to hit it. It's very hard to follow podcasts anymore, but I'm confident you can do it. If you're on any other podcasting app, please do the same thing. Hopefully, it's easier. And please enjoy today's show. We are born free. We'll die free. The time in between, though, that's complicated. In that time, governments, institutions, and our egos will limit our ability to find true freedom in this life. These are real stories of real people overcoming the odds, persevering in justice, and unlocking their potential. Welcome to Finding Freedom. Here's your host, John Oderman. Hey. I am joined by a man who needs no introduction, uh, Cyprian, also known hey. as, uh, or previously known as, uh, as Vin Armani. Also, Vin. also known as Fine. <laughs> For the people AKA. who know me as Vin, I don't know. It's one of those weird things where, like, I see people wanting to be. I think you know we've we've hit this like political correctness thing where it's so into our into our being. You know, you know mm -hmm. what I mean. But you know, so many people like. I think I probably first spoke to you and I was going by Vin and it's one yeah. of those things where it's like, it's so rude. You know, I'm not like a, like, like one of these individuals who was like, Oh no, I, I'm identifying as this, whatever. It's like this it's, I've had many name changes in my life and it's like, this is the one that I'm like introducing myself as from now on. But mm -hmm. anybody who has, who knows me as Vin, it's like, call me Vin. It's fine. Like my mother knows me as my birth name, which isn't Vin. And she, I, I've never asked her to call me by anything else, or my brother, or any of my friends from right. the previous names. So it's fine. If if it if it ends up being Vin, that's perfectly fine with me. That's perfectly so how, fine. How many different names have you have you gone by? Well, there's my birth name, mm -hmm. and so I went by that primarily until about the age of. I'm going to say 20, 19 or 20. And then I was in like the rave scene, underground hip hop scene and was a DJ. And so I would always introduce myself by my DJ name because like basically everybody that I was meeting, I, I think a lot of artists understand this, right? Like especially DJs at that time, we're talking the, the late 90s, early 2000s. And so it was like, well, I'm not going to introduce myself as my birth name just as a brand thing, right? Because it's like, no, I'm going to introduce myself as my DJ name. So then when you see my name on a flyer, then you're like, oh, I just met that guy and you show up, right? It's just, there's not the confusion. You know, I, I learned this because I had somebody who was, who, who knew me by my birth name and then somebody who knew me by my DJ name and were actually talking about me and said, oh, that's like my friend so-and-so. And, and they were talking about me they were both talking about the same person, but using different names, right? So it was like, okay, this doesn't make any sense. Um, and and my friends actually gave me that name. So like my good friends gave me that name, and and 
you know, they were also artists. And so we ended up all calling each other by that. And I went by that until honestly, like everybody in my life knew me by that name until I was 31. But that's the only way I would introduce myself. Um, so like, you know, outside of the things where it had to be like my legal name or whatever, there were some employers and things like that. But um, then Vin Armani was a stage name that my agent came up with basically when this, this, when I got on this TV show and he was, he, he kind of gave us all names. He said, listen, okay. You know, we had all been sort of working as, as escorts. That's what, you know, the show is about gigolos. And right. so um, we had all been working under like first names, you know, like nothing special. And then he was like, nah, you need a last name and a first name. And it's gotta be Googleable to where you're like the only result that shows up. So he spent two months with the most like ridiculous names. He was giving me all kinds of weird ones, but he's, he like his creativity only went so far, which was like, it's really par for the course for that kind of like what you would imagine the agent of a bunch of like model slash gigolos to be like, he's exactly like that. Right. So he was like, how about, Kind of like Prada. the movie Zool- Zoolander. A Zoolander. Bit, like. <laughs> exactly <laughs> like that, right? So he's, I remember it's, it was like crazy because he would keep calling me. You know, this is like 2010. So it's like we weren't mm-hmm. quite on the texting yet, you know, everybody. So he would be calling me. And I remember one time where he was like, how about Prada? Vincent, because I'd been working as Vincent. It was like, how about Vincent pra- uh, Prada? And I was like, listen, dude. He had already named one of the guys Jimmy Dior. And like, so I was like, listen, is is all you're going to do is you're just going to go through fashion brands and do this? I was like, Prado. I said, I like Prado, like Vincent Prado. That's, I could have gone by that. That would have been a, I would have liked that. That would have been a cool name. And he was like, nah, I just, it doesn't have that luxury. And I was like, it's totally Zoolander, right? <laughs> like totally out of Zoolander. And so this went on for probably about two weeks. And then he called me and he was like, I've got it. Vin Armani. And I remember exactly where I was. I was like walking into Gold's Gym in downtown LA on 7th Street, like walking on the street. And I remember my initial reaction was, that's by far the worst and most ridiculous of all of the suggestions that you have. And I think just the, the place that I was in at that time, something clicked and it was like, no, that's actually good because it's so ridiculous that it kind of is like, it's disarming because it's like, you're kind of in on, it says that I'm kind of in on the joke. Right. That like, let's not take this so seriously. You know well, what I mean? So, it's so ridiculous that people would even would think it's your real name, maybe because exactly. you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. <laughs> because, it, because it's so ridiculous, right? Yeah. Because, because it's like Vin Arma. And what's interesting is that like people, that was actually a response from a lot of like the media that looked at the show, the they would continually be like, that's obviously not his real name. He happens to be a real man. I remember there's a Vice Magazine article about our show that's actually brilliantly written and just like biting and great. And like, if somebody's taking a, a, you know, a jab at me, but they're doing it in a way that's like brilliantly done, I'm laughing. You know what I mean? Like, I love Mm -hmm. to go to a comedy show and if that person is really going to come out and like, do audience work and really gets me. Oh, you've made my day. Like I'm, I'm totally laughing at that. Like it's brilliant, right? Like go ahead. Now don't do something that's just like crude at my expense. But in this one, they're like, you know, he said something like, you know, Vin Armani is remarkable for the fact that he is an actual human person named Vin Armani. And I was like, yeah, that's it. You know, like that's, that's kind of it. You know, that's that's kind of the point. And so Mm -hmm. when but obviously that represents a particular time in my life, you know, like it's specifically for me and my understanding of myself and my like personal journey. Right. Clearly, it represents like this very specific 
moment and experience and journey and time in my life that like is over for me now, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like, I was a single guy. I was 31 years old. You know, I was in this particular profession. I was on this TV show. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm totally, not only am I different, but it's like, I look back and I'm like, I wouldn't do that again. You know, like, yeah. Yes, I thank God that I did it because like I learned so much, but were I to go back and do it again, like I definitely would not do it again. Right? So It's interesting. When Yes. <clears throat> go ahead. Be, be, go ahead. It's, it, it's interesting. Be, I mean, I understand what, why you're saying that. And I have things in my life that I look look back sure. at the, the same way. But you know, sometimes people look at a uh, you know something like that that has really for good or for bad has put you down a path um, that, that really, that really is the essence of, of who you are today, even though you're not that person mm -hmm. anymore. Right. So, right. and, that, and I think that that's really the, that's really where this name change came in was, I mean, I, I didn't pursue orthodoxy to change my name, right? Like that wasn't even a part of this right. idea, but the idea of a baptismal name is definitely an aspect of this whole thing. And the way that it came was, I think, you know, a lot of people, they're going to be baptized. It's like, well, what's your baptismal name? And it's kind of this idea that you're, if you're not infant baptized, like my children, um, then you're supposed to like choose like your patron or whatever, you know? And my spiritual father had introduced me to early on in sort of my catechism, he had introduced me to St. Cyprian of Antioch, who's like a really, it's, he's both got one of the most wildest saint stories, like his life. He was a sorcerer, a pagan sorcerer who basically wow. like, which is crazy. And the story is an incredible. And, uh, and uh, in part of the ancient church, I, I think, you know, it both I opened see, my I can eye. see the parallels between him and you a little bit. Well, and he and he introduced me in. I think I was in a place where I was having some difficulty struggling with. I mean, you know, as of late, there's been sort of I got into this row with Dave Smith, and and that engendered because he has you know this army of individuals that if you mm -hmm. that's sort of part of his brand and everything that like if he goes you know if he points the fire hose like here they come right so. What, I, I thought that it was a very interesting, and it was something that I had already dealt with. So, but it, it it was like, well, of course that's it. Like, hey, this guy's a here. He's saying that he's a Christian now, but isn't this guy a whore? Like, wasn't this guy a hooker? You know what I mean? Like, what's this hooker talking about? Now he's a Christian. Like, you're just a hooker, man. Like, that's you know. And it's like, yeah, bro, I already went through that. Mm -hmm. Like. <laughs> That was, yeah, I know who, who and what I was and, and, and am, right? Because it's a piece of me and my history, right. so it will never go away. Like, I know who I am. You don't need to tell me who I am. And it's like, I, I was already sort of going through that, that it's like, how can, how can I, how can I now become this different person? And I think that that was, he helped, like my spiritual father helped me work through that. And then obviously Christ got me the rest of the way. But it's like, yeah, that's kind of the point. <laughs> like that's the, if you go and you read the saints, like, yeah, that's the point. The point is everyone can be tr like, that's what salvation is. You know, that it's like, mm -hmm. I recognize, I recognize that this ain't, this isn't gonna, I mean, I recognized that long before I became a Christian. I recognized that when I became a father, it was like, nah, man, this life is not going to cut it. You love your child. You love your wife. Like, what are you going to continue to do this? That you can't like that. That wouldn't be in, that wouldn't be a manifestation and an expression of the love that you have for them. So like, yeah, I, I had dealt with that, you know? And so, and so when this opportunity came, it was like, he had introduced me to the saint, but then when he was coming here to baptize me, he, I hadn't even thought about what name I, I, there was a few, I had talked with like my godfather about potential few, but I didn't really have anything. I was just figured, ah, oh, it'll, it'll be presented. 
And he just one day just sent me a message and was like, your baptismal name will be Cyprian. He was like, that's it. Done. Wow. And so I said, yep, yep, that's it. And, and it's interesting that it's just, it was one of those many things in my journey that it was like the perfect transformation of how I got my previous name, right? That like this, my sort of shepherd through that process, my agent who was like also my confessor in a way in that world, like who I would talk to about the things that were happening and people who have seen the show, he's a part of the show and they could kind of see like, oh, he is kind of like the bishop over these kind of like priests of wickedness, you know what I mean? And so it was just this, he baptized and, and he sort of baptized me into that world, you know, uh, my mm -hmm. agent did. And so it was this very like beautiful transformation. And the fact that the name came along with it, it was like, of course the name came along with it, you know, like, so, so yeah, so it, so it's, I understand the depth of a name, you know, I, I, it's, it's had a big impact on me. And so like, so that, so that's where the Cyprian that's, I haven't yeah. told that whole story, but that's where the whole story of the name comes in. You know, it's, it's really interesting. And you are very unique in the way that you've had these distinct different phases, not only the different phases, everyone goes through, you know, different uh, seasons in life, different you know phases in life, but that you have a distinct name almost to those seasons. Exactly. It's is, yeah. is pretty remarkable. Um, and so, well, you curious... know, that, that actually, John, that used to be the standard. Yeah. Like in most societies, that was the standard, particularly for men. So you would have like your birth name and then you would have like your initiation name. So your adult name. Uh, this is pretty true in indigenous societies. And then you would have and what still happens in uh, Islamic societies is you'd have your nom de guerre. You'd have your war name. Hmm. So, you know, there'll be uh, Abu, Abu, whatever, which means brother something. You know, so they'll say Abu Nadal or whatever, and it'll be like Abu something all something. Right. So I might be like Abu Cyprian um, El Amriki, which would be like Brother Cyprian the American. So whenever they like arrest these terrorists, they always tell us they're nom de guerre. They're like Abu Bakr al Baghdadi. That's not his birth name. Oh. Right. So this guy, that's not his birth name. That's his gnome de guerre. Brother Bakr from, Bagd from Baghdad. Because he's Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Hmm. Right. So if you see al-Amriki, that means the American. Al-Baghdadi, that means he's from Baghdad. Interesting. Right. Al-Libi. So you'll see al-Libi has been some of the other terrorists that they found. That means he's the Libyan. That means the Libyan. So if you're fighting, Mujah, Mujahideen are coming from all over the place, right? So that's how they identify themselves. It's like, oh, Brother Bakr from America. Brother Bakr from Chechnya. They're two different people, right? So this is like, this is an ancient tradition. It's really standard. It's been a standard thing for men to do for a very long time. It, it, it makes sense. Um, you know, what, what better way to take ownership of a of a life change than actually change mm -hmm. the name that you're being called by. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, just just one more question on this. We don't have to talk about this yeah. the whole time. We're it's it's a cool it's about. something that I haven't but, gotten a chance to talk about. Yeah. So it's cool. Yeah. Well uh, I'm curious. So looking back on your you know your past life um you know on the show and, and working as a as a male escort, when you look back on that time, how do you look back on it? And re really how has 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 Christ change the way that, that you look back on it yeah, for sure for sure i would say that and i think that like professional athletes actors uh people who have been who have had some level of celebrity and then it's over which it always is at a certain point right mm -hmm. um there's lots of approaches to it so some the 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 least healthy approach I don't know that I ever had this, but I've witnessed it from my co-stars. I was lucky because I had like, you know, 
a number of co-stars who I got to go kind of on this journey with. So I got to see, and they've had varying degrees of dealing with the, the end, like what do you do next, right? They've done it at varying degrees of success in all those meanings. So one is you never let it, you can never let it go. And that's kind of the saddest, right? That's like, we look at people, I mean, somebody that's coming to mind on that is like a Corey Feldman or something like that, that like, they're still, and you could understand some of the reasons why. If you had some trauma there that was never really resolved, you can't really move past that period in your life, right? This happens with a lot of child stars, you know, and it's kind of really sad to see when we see it. Then the other, and I think where I was for a long time before Christ was uh, like nostalgia, you know, to where sometimes I would sit around and think and like remember like, ah, oh, wow, wasn't that ah, to be back, like just to sort of go back through the memory banks and just sort of yeah, like relive of these things, right? Um, mm -hmm. The interesting thing about that was it's it was always colored in a far more positive light than it was. That's the problem with nostalgia, you know, that we we don't look at the entire picture. We look at, we, we, we cherry pick the good parts. Yeah, the, and the we memory ignore, is not... 100% accurate as to what actually happened. right yeah. right and it's and i think what what christ has allowed for me is to have a much more first removed experience of that like of the memory and then to also have a much less nostalgic and much more whole view that it, it, you know that it's like okay we're going to observe this and it's like you can transform this like something can be potentially pulled out of this experience because you there's a lesson in there. But the only way you're going to get this lesson is you're going to have to actually deal with where you failed in this. Right. And also the negative aspects, both of what was happening around you, but particularly of your intentions at that time. Like, where were you missing the mark? Where were you failing? And so I haven't even mined all of the lessons. I, 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 on a daily basis, you know, it's helped to open up more to where I'm able to actually mine the lessons of my past in a way where I can feel comfortable to allow myself to see the whole thing. Whereas I think before I had a Christian, a real Christian framework for doing that, an Orthodox framework for doing that, like I was afraid to look at the negative, mm -hmm. but, and, and because it was so, it would convict me so much, right? It was and so I, accusatory. I think, I think that's why people, um, at least partly the reason why, you know, when you did have the, the rift, the, uh, you know, the back and forth with Dave Smith, why people put you back in that box because, yeah. and I'm guilty of this too. In my own life, there's parts, everyone has parts of their life where we look to, sure. and go, oh man, how did I do that? And and they mm -hmm. look and they and they look at other people and say, "Wow, I saw, I saw you know Vin on TV doing this stuff, and he's going to come mm -hmm. here and, and tell me what I should be doing." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a you know what? It's a completely reasonable response, you know, which was the reason why I didn't like. What am I going to say to it? You know, what I mean, mm -hmm. it's like okay, like yeah, you're yeah. right. Like I don't think that that's. I don't even think that that's like your best. If you want to attack and hurt me, it's like just a point of advice. Like it's not the best <laughs> attack. Like I'm just yeah. letting you know, like it, it doesn't hurt me. If anything, it frustrates me because you're not telling me anything that I don't already know. It's like, at least if you're going to critique me, give me the opportunity to change something. You know, this is something that I can't change, but I, uh, you know, because it's a part of my past, but it's like, yeah, I know you don't even, here's the thing. You don't even, the people who are like, oh, the insult is that like you, oh, he's a hooker. And it's like, yeah, man, that's actually, that's actually the part I'm least ashamed of. Mm. Right. The, the, the things that I was doing in my relationship with others that you didn't see, that no one knows except me and them and the things that I was doing and how I was taking advantage of people, 
not because of my profession, but because of my celebrity and what I was able to get away with and what people would let me get away with. And because of what was wrong in my own heart and my own insecurities, mm -hmm. that's what I'm ashamed of. See, but you don't know anything about that. Right? You don't know anything about that. Yeah. The, the you're a hooker part is not, it's like, okay, yeah, that was my, I was literally on a TV show about it. Like, tell, tell me something that millions of people don't know. Okay. The, if you want if you want to get at something that's going to sting, tell me, tell me the, the real damage that I did. Right. But the thing is, you don't know that. Mm -hmm. You don't know. You know, if you really want to accuse me, you can't accuse me. You can't accuse me more than I've been accused by by my God. Right. I, you can't you can't do that. <laughs> you can't do it. So it's like. I get it. Like I get the impulse. It's fine. But it's yeah, it's more annoying than anything, I would say frustrating. But I get it. Yeah. So we were talking briefly in the in the pre-show about a, a podcast you were just on, King Pilled, with, uh, with Matthew <laughs> and and Stephen, which it's that was a journey. I mean, people people need to. I mean, it's it's a great show. I love King Pilled, and I will say about Stephen. Stephen is one of the funniest people I, I've ever Very seen funny. before. I love um, him. He's, I love him. His his form of comedy is it's it's brilliant. It's, it really really is. Mm -hmm. Agreed. It, sneak, it sneaks up your onion, slaps you right in the face. But had a great. I, I encourage everyone after that, you know listen to this or you know today or tomorrow, go uh, watch that episode of King Peeled because they're going get, to get into. I'm sure a lot of stuff we're not going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, there'll be some overlap, but uh, that's how podcasts work. But one thing that you talked about there that I wanted to dive into a little bit more, this really struck me when you said it. And it's something that I've been experiencing in my own liberty journey, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, the difference between two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, um, the Ron Paul revolution, uh, how we were talking to people then, how we were... Uh, spreading the message of liberty, as, as mm -hmm. they say, compared to today. Mm -hmm. And it seems like there's a, a group of people, um, they've been called post-libertarians, that seem to understand that there's been a shift. Um, and you've, mm -hmm. I mean, you were the first one on this, talking about really what's happened. And the, the playing field has, has changed. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think really the difference is and why there's a lot of talking past each other between people like who are in the Mises caucus and mm -hmm. and uh, and the post libertarians is that I think the people in the Mises caucus think that we're still in an environment that is 2012 type environment that after after COVID is over, which it'll never be over, um, the things will return to return to the way they were. And uh, you had a great analogy and, and you can you can go into it <laughs> talking about how previously missing the mark, um, the result would be you get slapped with a you know, sl little, little slap in the face with a white glove and uh, missing the mark now in, uh, in today's environment, um, someone is uh, coming at you wielding a knife. So I just wanted to get you to, to go into that a, a little bit more. I think that's the real, I, I think that that's a really good heuristic. It's, it's been, I had never really expressed it that way. It's one of the reasons why, like, I like to be able to come on and have this dialogue, have, have a dialogue, you know, much more than I think I would, I, I did the whole like, you know, thing with my own podcast and everything. And it's like the monologue is, I don't know. It seems like you just like repeat nothing new comes. Right. It's like you need somebody else to, you know, to, to speak in a dialogue. But this is it's I, and I think that it's it. It's not that they necessarily think that we're or maybe it, it's related. Right. So it's not that they necessarily think that the world is the same. But they haven't yet figured out that the consequences for failure have changed. And I think that there's a subtle difference there, but it's, it's an, it's a crucial difference. And it's, it's the difference that 
I, it's something that uh, Matt Erickson from Kingpilled had said mm -hmm. sort of very early on as this conversation started. Um, and it was vis-a-vis -vis some of the stuff with Dave Smith and the Mises Caucus was he said, you know, the problem is that there are people who can't afford to get this wrong. They can't like right now, there's people who can't afford to get this wrong. And he said this months ago. And I don't think people understood what he was saying. I think now as these mandates come in and people are actually losing their jobs, you know, because they didn't take action then, because you sort of imagine there's people who are losing their jobs today, right? And that, that was what, April, March or April that that whole thing kind of started, maybe May. It's like, yeah. bro, think about if you're losing your job today, but in May, you would have truly believed and set your heart on like, oh, man, I don't have long. I'm, I'm about to lose my job over this. Think about how different your actions would have been and think about where you would be now in terms of your quality of life, your level of stress, your ability to provide for your family. You wouldn't be in panic mode. Mm -hmm. And that's really that's really what I think the message and it was some of the fact that it was lost was my fault. Right. I was being provocative. I was saying, you know, I made bad word choices. I wasn't addressing the audience and dealing with them where they were. I made a lot of mistakes on that. And I've apologized multiple times. And it's like I actually really feel bad about it because I'm like, bro, how many people if you would have done this differently, potentially, could you have put in that better situation, right? Like how many people did you leave behind because you decided that you were gonna make a provocative word choice? It's been a big lesson for me really, you know, that it's like, hey man, it kind of doesn't matter if you know that all of this is coming, if you can't communicate it to somebody without like triggering them and turning them off to what you're saying. It kind of doesn't matter. Yeah, well, it's it's difficult though because you want to you need to be a certain degree. There needs to be a certain degree of uh, productivity in order to for people to go, oh wow, this is this is different. This is this is something that no one else is saying. But at the same time, yeah, there, there needs to be um, enough. Uh, I don't know enough uh, of a, of an olive branch extended, or that's really not the right word. I don't know what I'm looking for, but there needs to be uh, some degree of a uh, of of, of a, a welcoming, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I'm not the I I know me. I'm not. Who knows if I'm good at it or not? What I could say is I'm not practiced at it. You know, which is one of the reasons why I've been like so appreciative of of Mark Claire, obviously. And, mm -hmm. and the way that he has been able, I think that he moved the conversation that was at a complete standstill. I think in just a little, like with his humor, self-deprecation, you know, um, humbleness, humility in speaking that like to literally say the same thing, but to say it in such a way that it's like no one taking offense, people might disagree, but they're not triggered by it. And it's like, that's what I've told, I've told him privately and I've said publicly, like, wow, you know, like, wow, that's, mm -hmm. I'm impressed. Like I can be, I know I can be bombastic. I can say things that are people are like, whoa, that's wild. Like I've never heard that before, but it's like that, what he's doing, I'm not practiced at. Like that's a place where I'm like, wow, I could be so much better at that. You know what I mean? Like, wow. If like it's a it's a great role model for me moving forward, you know what I mean? Um, well, I don't want to lose about, the bombasticness though, but yeah, I, still, well, you, I just want to be better, you know. You, you need that, yeah. The thing the thing about Mark, I mean, I, I've been able to see you know up up close how he's changed, you know, mm. over the past several years, and um, it, it's it's interesting. And I don't want to put put words in his mouth, but I just saw him post on uh, on Twitter recently. There was a a New York Post headline or something talking about uh, you've you've probably seen it that uh, seventy five percent of uh, people who cheat say it improves their marriage. Oh, I saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Mark, you know, posted something like you know the the degeneracy propaganda or mm -hmm. something to that effect. And Mark from two years ago um, probably would have thought nothing of that. Would have thought, oh well, maybe mm -hmm. you know maybe that's the way it is. But he he's he's been on his own journey, 
And, mm-hmm. uh, and honestly, I mean, you're calling him a role model, but I, I know I can speak for myself and a little bit for Mark too. I think that, that you, in the way that you've kind of brought, brought us along uh, to a certain degree, just by, just by stepping well, out there. So you know, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to see people that's, feeding that's, off yeah. each other. <laughs> that's, that's what, that's what community is supposed to be. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what community is supposed to be. I had a CEO uh, of a startup that I was working for. And he's kind of a bit of an aristocratic British guy, went to all the best schools and this and that. But he said when he was in business school, he had been a CEO of some Electrolux and some other like big multinational brands. And he, he said when he was in business school, he remembers this guy came, I forget who he said it was. And he said the definition of leadership is finding a group of people going in a certain direction and standing in front of them. And there's like... Hmm. There's a cynical aspect to that, but there's also a really, like you could look at it two ways, right? You could look at it as like cult leader types or like opportunists or whatever that it's like, oh, here's this movement and I'm gonna go stand in front of it and I'm gonna be the figurehead and everybody's gonna look at me, right? There's, that's one way of looking at it. Or there's the responsibility way of looking at it. That it's like, oh, here's all these people going in a certain direction Let me stand in front of them and take the shots. You know, let me be the one to take the shots so that they can keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's, it's stand, it's doing the same thing, but the intent is so different that the nature of what's taking place changes so much. And I think that that is really the heuristic of a real, they talk about this Liberty movement. For the first time, I'm seeing that heuristic where it's like, okay, I'm going to stand in front. Okay, I'll stand in front. Okay, I'll stand in front. Okay, I'll stand in front. And it's like, wow, that's that's something that's got a spirit underneath it that's like a positive spirit, mm-hmm. you know, that it, that it doesn't require resurrecting. Like, what are we going to do when Ron Paul dies? You know, you're going to resurrect him. You're going to like, you're going to embalm him like Lenin and like put him in a, a, a casket so that like everybody can come and visit. And you're going to like, you know, bring the casket to pork fest uh, every, uh, every year so that people can come and make a pilgrimage to the casket of Ron Paul. Like, what are you going to do? You know, um, it's got to be, it's got, it's got to have its own momentum. Yeah. You know? So I, I think, you know, we talk about it. We talk about a, a, a journey of Liberty and, I, like my principles in that regard have not changed. You know, I, I hesitate to call myself a libertarian just because it's so loaded at this moment. And I think that that's what all, all of us, I don't call myself a post libertarian either, but I think the people being labeled as that, or the people who, who have adopted that, or the people talking about it, it's like, I don't see any of their principles, their fundamental, well, with a few exceptions. Okay. There are a few exceptions where I'm like, mm, this seems really different, but I'm also going to say that that's somebody working through something. You know, that it's like my my gut, my instinct tells me that that's a temporary move for them. Mm-hmm. They've got to explore that thought in order to prove it wrong. And as an engineer, it's something that I do all the time. And so I'm going to give them the, the space to do that. I'm going to push back. I'm going to tell them it's wrong. But I'm not going to say, oh, this person has completely abandoned their principles. It's like, no, you know, let's keep talking about it. Well, it's it's a very different time um, in 2021 when everyone is on Twitter and we're communicating Mm -hmm. constantly, tweeting out our feelings. I mean, there's things that I'm working through, you know, trying to figure out, Mm -hmm. you know, the direction I want to take my show, um, how I'm going to navigate, you know, this this crisis that we're in. And there's things that I'll tweet out where I'll look back on two months later and say, you know, I really shouldn't have said it that way. Um, but so we're all, we're all, we're all working through it. And it's just when, you know, the leaders in the movement, people that have big followings, you know, it's going to be, you're more exposed and uh, yep. it's, it's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just, it's just really the reality of what what's happening. And I think that, you know, it's, it's maybe to pre- present something that maybe somebody watching this who might, their knee-jerk reaction might be attack or something like that, which mine can often be, you know, is that to maybe look at this person and see 
have they changed? Like, are they are they just are they an ideologically possessed NPC? So go back 10 years. Are they saying the same thing that they were saying 10 years ago? Or else look at their progression. Mm -hmm. Have they changed? Have they grown? Have they evolved in their thought? Um, and are they, would you say that you appreciate and respect them more now than you did in the past? So in other words, have they changed overall on the trajectory? Have they changed for the better? And if the answer to that is yes, then you have to know that part of that journey was stumbling along the way. It, ha it has to be. Because if, they're, if they've grown, you can't grow without screwing up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you see the trajectory, assume that the trajectory is continuing. And if you see something that looks like a failure, a fall, be like, root for them to get up. You know, and and anticipate that they that they'll be getting up because right. it's it because they have in the past, you know, and so cutting them out, you know. But also, I think that there's also a danger in compromising, right? So this is something that I've seen is people who are friends, you know, that. And I've, I've, I've heard this sort of said a lot, that someone will go to like criticize so someone else's position or their approach. And they'll preface it with like, well, I love this guy. You know, I, I love him. You know, but here's the thing. And I, I think that that's not helpful. There's actually like a big trap there. Really? If you love them, yes. Because if you if you love them, take the gloves off. Like about their position, not about them. Should but I, I, I will ask you this though: Do you think that that individual, you know, before saying something like that, I love them, but and then criticizing maybe on a podcast or in a public forum, should they be going, you know, directly to the person and saying it, taking the gloves off and saying it to them? You know, it's a it's a good, it's a Good question. But I think in this case, it because it's going to deal with a public person who's making their positions public. And part of what's happening, part of what we're doing, if we're doing it right, if 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 we're aimed at the target, mm -hmm. then like what you and I are doing right now is for the benefit of the people watching like we're we're trying to to like crowdsource a consciousness and think through a problem and i think that it's perfectly fine to say you and i are both trying to get to the same place like it's perfectly fine for me to say i believe you are trying to get to the same destination i am trying to get to okay however I also believe that if someone were to follow you, that they would follow you with what you're saying to do, that they would follow you into ruin. And it's actually really important to be forceful about that if you really believe it and to not compromise because what are we trying to do, right? I'm not, I want you to get there too. Like, I'm not saying I want to get there and I want you to not. I'm not saying I want to own you and make you look bad in front of people. I'm not right. saying that I want you to lose status. I'm saying, are we trying to get there or are we not? I'm also willing to acknowledge I might be wrong, right? I might be wrong, but here's my position. And here's why I feel that your position is not only like off, because off is one thing. Right. If someone's position is just off, it's like, OK, let's let's clarify that. Let's have a dialogue and like zone in. Maybe we have the wrong definitions of words. Maybe we're not talking about the same thing. Like, let's get this in line. But we both have basically the same strategy. OK, but that's very different than seeing someone who you actually believe. Like if you love them, it's like I actually believe they want to get to this place of liberty that I want to get to. They want to get to the same place, but it's like the you're driving your car off a cliff. 
it's perfectly acceptable if someone who's on you know and people are like why are you why would you go against somebody and be so aggressive when you're on the same team and it's like because we're on the same team if we were enemies why would i say anything if right. my enemy's about to drive his car off a cliff i'm going to let him seriously like yeah you like that's me right i actually understand how how you know what i mean like if someone is your enemy and they're making a gigantic mistake i'm not let them what shh quiet they're they're about to just they're about to take themselves out of the equation stop that's how you don't win. say anything that's how you win yeah. so if i'm yelling you're going off a cliff stop the car and then even if you don't stop the car and you're like man screw you get out of here and i'm like no you dumb sob you're going off an effing cliff and you're like why are you yelling at them you're on the same team do you get what i'm saying here yeah yeah so it's like don't compromise like if you truly believe that what they're doing is going to hurt themselves and others who would be your allies when you get to the promised land you gotta if they're going off the cliff you gotta yell it and if they don't answer you gotta curse metaphorically right now there's a right way and a wrong way to do that i've done it the wrong way several times right but i'm trying to get better right so talking about getting people going the same direction and i mean you you've talked about what you believe is the uh, is the correct direction and what people need to be doing and one thing you've talked about a lot um is is building the ark mm -hmm. and that's that's one of the main reasons i wanted to have you on the show just to kind of you know put some put some guide rails around what you mean by that so when you talk about building the ark first of all what does that mean for you personally okay yeah i won't i won't get into all of the I, I think the first thing that i'm going to say that's important because it seems to be something that's misunderstood but i think it's probably now gotten out of control like i understand where these things once you put a concept out once you put a meme out like it's going to mm -hmm. mutate in however it mutates right yeah. i no longer have control over it so people take, people take it and they they attach their own label to they it their own. and yeah. they attach their own it's got their it's got their own meaning and I, I think that all of the things that people are doing associated with it i think are positive um but there i have noticed in the way that people would use this that there is a very materialist bent to it and it's something like i'm getting multiple streams of income i'm making myself self-sufficient i'm doing all of these they're very material mm -hmm. right um and it's not what i'm talking about and it's not the it's not what the arc means in terms of the sort of spiritual and mm -hmm. theological idea of what the arc is so the arc being a vessel for the holy spirit and the Holy Spirit being that spirit which is going to direct you in the direction that you should be going. So build the ark is the answer to what should I do? Maybe that's the best way to start it. That everybody's been, the question that's been coming to me is like, what should I do? What should I do? And, you know, as uh, you, you framed it in an interesting way, an appropriate way, where you said, you know, I've been talking about what people need to do. And like, Yes, yes, that's true. Um, but I, I've, I've tried and I've probably failed to, how, let me back up. Sure. One of the, one of the things that I see, that, that I have seen, that I've thought was a blind spot in the liberty movement, and I particularly saw it when I went to move my family to New Hampshire uh, to be a part of the Free State Project in 2018, right? So we lived there for a year. And until my, and we would have lived there longer, but my second daughter was born. It was like, let's move back to where family is. All right, guys, I want to take a quick break in the show today to tell you about a great new sponsor that we have. 
I trust capital. If you're someone who maybe has a, you know, an old 401k that you moved into an IRA somewhere when you left a job, you just have the money sitting there. What do you do with it? Try to invest in stocks, whatever other bull crap out there. What if you could invest that money in crypto, invest it in physical gold and silver? Well, you can do that with I Trust Capital. But with I Trust Capital, you have the tax benefits of an IRA while trading in crypto assets. And on top of that, like I said, you can also have access to buying physical gold and silver into your account. It's it's amazing. If you sign up using promo code LIONS at I Trust Capital, you'll get the first month free. Now, I Trust Capital is safe and secure. Uh, they are backed by Coinbase Custody and Curve uh, to secure clients' digital assets. And they have 320 million of insurance to make sure your funds are safe and secure. On top of that, they are trusted. They have 1,300 reviews on Trustpilot. And they are 100% transparent in their fees, which, you know, I can't really say that about all other IRA providers. Now, whether you're holding your assets long term or you want to buy and sell with the market, I Trust Capital's IRA gives your account or provides the account the lowest transaction fees for buying Bitcoin or, or other digital currencies. As an I Trust client, you'll be able to log into your account, make trades 24 7, trades execute in real time and settle in seconds. Um, they offer more cryptocurrencies than any other crypto IRA provider out there, and they're adding more all the time. Go to itrustcapital.com, use promo code LIONS for your first month free. So we, we moved back to California where my family is from because my second daughter was born. Otherwise, we would have we stuck around. It was just like, now let's get back around family, you know what I mean? Um, one of the things that becomes very apparent when you're around in person around lots of libertarians. You know, like that was an opportunity to be, to be around lots of libertarians constantly, is everybody's got an idea of what people need to do. What I noticed was what's incredibly rare is discussion of what they themselves are doing to change themselves. Mm -hmm. So much of the message is about how other people need to change their behavior to become righteous like me, the libertarian living by the nap, as I'm, I'm already righteous. It's everybody else that's not righteous and needs to change their behavior to match mine. And what, we, what I will do is I will move more righteous people in. We will take over the government, which is what the, you know, whether the Free State Project says this explicitly or not, this is implicitly what the plan is, yeah, right? I think that's We're gonna, pretty obvious. That that's right. their plan. We're going to get a bunch of people elected because, and why do we have to do that? We have to do that because they're all wicked. Because if we don't pass laws for them to be righteous, they won't be righteous on their own. This, this, It has to be. That's necessarily the implicit idea of why you need to take over the government and pass laws or, or change laws or revoke laws or whatever. It's because, mm -hmm. well, the people who are currently there won't do it on their own because if they could do it on their own, it would be as simple as like, well, let me just talk to you and change your mind and do it. It's it, implicit in that is the people who are currently in office will never change their mind. The people who currently are in control will never be able to have their minds changed. So we need to replace them with righteous people. What I noticed was like, there's, there's not, there's nothing about like, what do you need to do? And this is, this is actually quite, I don't want to say anathema, but it's like, it's not familiar to me in my own experience. And wh what I, what I mean by that is like, so if we go back to like the journey of Vin Armani, mm -hmm. The, the presupposition that I had to have coming into that is that the world is not going to change. Like there's not, you know, my success is going to be determined on how much people want to spend time around me and pay money to do so. And that's, it's not like, well, people should be paying me more money and people should want to hang out with me. So I need to go and change all the laws so that there's a law that everybody has to hang out with me and pay me. 
right? Eh, that's not going to work. What is going to work? Oh, I need to be sure that my diet is on point. So I always have a six pack. I need to be working out and, and, you know, in a pro bodybuilder gym so that it's crazy like that. I need to be spending thousands of dollars on my wardrobe and have a stylist so that I look fly. Like I need to be reading up on these things that my clients seem to be interested in so that I can have three and four hour long conversations over dinner and keep the, 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 the meter running. You know, those are things I need to do. Like that's how I need to, to, to change. Mm -hmm. And if I do that, then what to do, my understanding of, well, what do I do next is going to drastically change because who I am has changed, right? So what Vin Armani does in a given situation is different than what Cyprian does in a given situation. It's different than what my pre when I was my previous names would do in that same situation, right? Because those are different people, right? So the answer to like, what do I do next? Well, it's really like, oh, you don't know what to do next? That's your real problem. Indeed, yeah. Some version of you knows exactly what to do next. So you need to become the version that knows what to do now. That's what build the ark means. You're the ark. The ark is a vessel. So it's like, you don't know what to do next? That's because you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Why are you not filled with the Holy Spirit? It's an inappropriate vessel. You're not sufficiently purified. Like, why are you not receiving inspiration and revelation about what you should be doing next? Why are people who can help you to know this not appearing in your life right now? Because you're not that per you're not the person for whom it would show up in their life. Right? This is this is also like this is the Matthew principle. You know, that that mm -hmm. that to 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 who to whoever has much much will be given or to whom much is given even more will be given like this is the idea where they say the rich get richer and they say well how does this person you know they're like bill gates well that's because his father you know was already wealthy and ran in these circles and all of that and it's like well what does that tell you are you trying to become a person who can run in those circles you know have you thought about all the ways that you could like i had i had a list clients I was hanging out with people that like, there's no reason that I like household names, you know, in private, having drinks in there, you know, being paid to be there in their massive hotel suite in Vegas that like, I didn't even know this, ex this piece of the hotel existed, you know, <laughs> like, whoa, mm -hmm. I didn't even know that there were suites this big. This is like the size of a seven bedroom house. Like what? I didn't even know this was here spiral staircases this was in here you know and it's like well i had what was that because of you know and i'm not saying i'm not saying this to brag about it i'm saying this as a matter of like learning a principle and the principle is like you have to change who you are if you don't know what to do right now become the person who knows what to do right now how do I become the person who knows what to do right now? Well, here's the thing. You don't know what to do in the first place. The ancients understood this. Like there is an energy. If Look, if you want to be, let's be secular. Okay, let's be secular for a minute because there's some people probably in the audience who need this to be taken to materialist terms, right? They don't want it to be, let's, they, let's maybe they don't want it to be the Holy Spirit or that's not enough for them right now. Yeah, sure. Okay? Not, not everyone's let's, ready. Not everyone's right. ready. Or, or just it's maybe it's not even ready, but it's like I I because I can look at myself and be like, ah, that Holy Spirit thing, it just isn't clicking. It doesn't make sense. I just didn't have you got to travel. Getting out of materialism when we've been there for so long is hard, mm -hmm. right? Like to our to our ancient ancestors, talking about the Holy Spirit was easy because they had the entire framework. But talking about like cells and atoms and stuff would be impossible. They don't have the framework for that, right? But right. so we it's fine. So let's take it something like this. Let's take it on a much more psychological level, but I'm going to preface this by saying like, this is so incomplete that it may as well be wrong. Okay. Like it's so ineffective that it may as well be wrong, mm -hmm. but like it's a starting point. Okay. Sure. And, and 
and what I would say is that it's it's something like it's it's something like when you become a so athlete may be too difficult, but there are people who out there who are trained professionals, okay, who have trained professionally in something. Sure. And you go to work and you say, and like you go to work and you might even be able to mindlessly get through this technical task because you've done it so many times, you know, the framework and you do know, all, do that all the time go. in my day job. Yeah. Right. And so it's like, <laughs> but, but before you, like when you were still a trainee, you, well, what comes next? You might ask the person that you're apprenticing under, Right. What comes next? Yeah, looking at notes, what, you know, trying to figure out. Yeah, what's what? What is this? What is mm -hmm. this? Right. But what you have to see is that it's like, what happened? What happened to where you now? So you start out and you go back to the tradition, right? You don't know what comes next, so you kind of go to the tradition. Well, who wrote the tradition? The instruction manual, mm -hmm. right? Who, or or you're apprenticing under somebody. Right. They're, they're, it's, it's not them. It's actually a line. It's, it's wisdom passing through. And as the wisdom fills you up over time, you no longer need to check back. It becomes literally a part of you. So if you're a professional, you know, if you're a, an, a, a, a carpenter, right? You're not thinking anymore about 99% of the things that you do. Like you are a carpenter. What comes next? It's not even a, you don't even think the words what, what comes next. You just, it's your, your, you just move mm -hmm. your body, just your body, your entire being just moves because this is what's next. And so what people have to understand is that it's like your culture that, that you are in has been through so many crises so many like if it's a carpenter it's built every kind of house and seen every kind of problem with the house billions of times over and the holy spirit is the spirit of your culture it is what has revealed because at times when things have been needed in a culture all of a sudden the solution gets revealed you have enough people people thinking about it, enough people working on it, and the solution gets revealed, right? It's that aha moment. It's the light bulb going on. And sometimes the solution is revealed before we even know we have a problem. I think Bitcoin is one of those examples. You know, sometimes the solution has been revealed and it's sitting there, and then we are able to go back and be like, whoa, this person just came up with, where did this come from? But it's totally useful yeah. to keep us alive right now. We're kind of coming there's, to that point right now. And it's, yeah. There's it's innumerable wild. examples of this. Innumerable examples. And so the tradition, in particular the Christian tradition, and in particular the way that Orthodox Christian tradition is understood, is that like it is the, the life of that energy which is delivering that revelation of wisdom. And that the entire purpose of that is to keep the people alive. It is life. And so like the rules, the purification, what that is, is to tell you, because if significant numbers of people are significantly purified, this is the system by which whatever that mystery is, right? For a materialist, it's like, it's something, isn't it? Like, where do these things come from? All of these technologies and stuff that people are, they're all revelatory experiences. Where do these come? They come it's not like, that's just fact. The people who come up with them will tell you that's fact. There are probably people watching or listening. I've had the experience happen myself. You know, as a software developer, I've got protocols that I've developed. And I will tell you, they always come like in a flash. Sometimes I'll sit up like first thing in the morning. And it'll be like, the whole idea will be there. And I'll be like, where did that come from? Right? I think a lot mm -hmm. of us have had those ideas. Oh, yeah. Or those, those, those moments, right? Oh, that's how I solved that problem. And it's like, what is that? And in some ways, it's like, okay, if you want to be materialist about it, and you want to say, 
well, it's just your brain firing off and it was actually there. And it's like, you can, that can happen on occasion and it's just synapses and connections being made. Then what I would say to you is, well, what if I could present you with a practice that you could do on a regular basis that would increase the frequency of that happening by like 20x? Would that would, be a worthwhile practice for I you to say? I would say yes. On? What's the practice? And I would say it's Orthodox Christianity. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, that's the entire purpose of it. It's the stated purpose of Orthodox Christianity. That is the transformation. That is you becoming the ark. That's what build the ark means. It's just like, look, everybody's asking what next. I don't have the answer to what's what next, but I can tell you how we get a chance at somebody coming up with the answer. A whole bunch of people who are who want to get to the place that I'm headed to. One of us is going to need to have a revelation. We need to, but there's so few of us that we need to keep the like we we need to increase the number of cycles, increase our chances of probability. Okay, Mm -hmm. like a one in a billion chance is not going to happen. We need to increase the probability that we're going to hit the mark. We're going to we need to increase the probability that someone is going to get the answer revealed to them. And it's like, here's a practice that does that. Right. So. For this and this is sort of the way that I came to it was very it's 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 a bit mercenary in that regard. But even the church says like, yeah, well, the mercenary approach is a pathway that, to to this. Even if you approach it as a mystery, uh, as a mercenary. If you do the practice, like you start to appreciate like, oh, wow, there's this. But it's so much like I came here for this. I came here for like something so minor compared to what is there. Mm hmm. You know, it's so much, I came here just for this answer, but it's like, whoa, I didn't even know the question. <laughs> like, like, I came here with the question, seeking an answer, but whoa, like if I would have even known the right question, you know? So that's, I think that's a good explanation of what Bill the Ark is. So um, when you talk about Orthodox Christianity, and honestly, up until, I don't know, nine months ago, I didn't know anything about it, and so I, th- I think I heard I think I heard you <laughs> you talking about it, and then I think it was my friend Howie who I don't know who he heard it from heard about the Lord of Spirits uh, podcast, yeah. and I started listening that's, to that's that. That's been the entree. Um, I've I've been a I've been a Christian for for years, um, you know, for a time in high school and college I was just just kind of floating along, not a not a practicing Christian. But uh, it, it's crazy. There's things that ha- I can point to times in my life that uh, people have just sort of appeared and put me back, mm-hmm. put me back on the path. Mm-hmm. So w- when you talk about those experiences, I, I can definitely relate to it. What, what I'm curious about, and you know, maybe this is a, a longer discussion than we have time for, but um, why Orthodox Christianity over? Other forms of uh, of Christianity, even just a uh, you know a non denominational Bible based Christianity. I know mm-hmm. with, with the Orthodoxy you have uh, the Lord of Spirits. It's uh, you know the Most High, and there's there's a th- th- there's more there. There there's mm-hmm. a I think there's a deeper understanding of the Bible. But do you think one has to be a actual practicing Orthodox Christian attending um, services, or can one? It sounds weird to say it like this. Can, can one um, l- learn from the outside and still uh, get the benefits? Yeah, that's it's your the framing of your question is completely revealing. Like the the the, the very framing of your question is like completely reveals why orthodox orthodoxy is not the same religion as what like the average american when they say christianity it's like mm-hmm. you may, you're not talking about the same religion the framing of your question like okay. says that so 
you know, the first thing I'll say is that it, it does seem like uh, with Libertarians, the Lord of Spirits podcast has been an introduction to to orthodoxy for many of them. Now, now again, this is my own personal opinion, but it's also something that other orthodox have said. Um, there's some internal squabbling about the production company, Ancient Faith, and all of that, and sort of their response to the COVIDism and all of that has not sat well with, I think, a lot of Orthodox. They've been like pro woke poke and all of that, and they fired some or or removed some people from out of their network, including like abbots of monasteries and things like that, like monks. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Who were citing elders and things like that. So, um. I will be honest, I have never made it through a whole Lord of Spirits episode. Uh, that might just be my own temperament, but it, for me, there's not, like, it's cool stuff, and I think that it's, mm -hmm. like, it's very interesting, but in terms of, like, at least for me, like, the, the meat, like, something where I walk away and I'm like, Oh, I feel closer to God now after this. You know, I've had many of those experiences in orthodoxy, um, both with external content and with like speaking one on one with priests or like in a larger group where it's something like a more of like a catechism sort of environment happening. I've had many experiences. I can say I have never had such an experience with Lord of Spirits. So I'll just start out with that. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like, you know, if if somebody's like, yes, like you're exposed to Orthodox priests and you're also exposed to sort of a greater Orthodox worldview and an understanding of how, how you know, or, Orthodox perceive certain things and certain, but a lot of it is, a lot of what's in there is a is trivial. It's meant for entertain, like, and I don't mean trivial, like, like it's an important part of the tradition, but it's kind of trivia. Right. The, the, the thing that the things that you wouldn't hear if you were just sitting down speaking with a priest, right. it wouldn't be these aren't high priorities in terms of something. You wouldn't even learn them in your catechism, probably, which is why they're doing Lord of Spirits. Right. That it's like, oh, yeah. this is something that even Orthodox don't know. Like right. Learning, these are learning about learning about giants and, uh, and things like. Yeah. That. Like this is something that would come up, but it's like, OK, this is not really going to affect your practice as an Orthodox yeah. Christian. Right. So I think the, 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 there's, a, so there's a couple of things like orthodoxy is experiential. Um, and the goal of, of orthodoxy is like the stated goal, the d like doctrinal goal is, um, the is theoria, the is theosis. Mm -hmm. And the theosis is, you know, they would say God became man so that men could become man could become God, little g. That it's the it's it would be the ultimate. Theosis would be the ultimate orientation, and it would be something that like a saint would have achieved. Mm -hmm. That it would be a, a communion with the Holy Spirit, where like the vessel is so pure that when you view the vessel, so you imagine like we're a vessel, like we're a a, a container you know, and we're filthy. So even if the Holy Spirit is inside of us, what's coming out and even evident to ourselves is a muted, a very muted light. If you imagine that the Holy Spirit is the light, right? But a saint would be like a vessel so clear that when you looked at them, all that you saw was the, the contents, right? Like what was left you couldn't see the vessel because it was so pure. There were so little impurities in it that it, all that shined forth from out of it was the Holy Spirit, right? So you're having an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Now they are not they they are not the Holy Spirit, right? Christ is the Holy is is the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, right? So it's fully God and fully man. So it's the the flesh of Mary and the Holy Spirit, right, come together and then is made man as Christ. Mm -hmm. And so when you see a saint, you're not experienced, you're, you're not, they are not the Holy Spirit, right? They are not one with the Holy Spirit, but they are a vessel 
that is in, in, in the ultimate that they are purely showing out, right? And so it's the process of purification. It's the practice of, the idea is that you're going to practice becoming pure enough that that would be the case. So orthodox practice is beseeching the entire, I, everything that's done is for the purpose of allowing the Holy Spirit to abide inside you, to come and live inside you, which first means not allowing other spirits to take up residence there, right? Which is, that's Christ's ministry. If you read the gospels, like that's what he's doing. He's healing the sick and casting out demons, right? And he talks a lot about, he talks a lot about us as a house, a house of spirits, right? That's Christ t- speaks a lot in the gospels, a lot th- yeah, about it's that. It's interesting in the modern church, it's not even really, it's not even referred to. Sure, they, they talk about it in the Bible, why would that just go away today? Why wouldn't that still it's, be the case? It's his entire ministry. Yeah. Like if you, this was actually one of the things that led me on this path. I tell people I ran across Derek Prince, who's this like Pentecostal, mm-hmm. which Pentecostals are pretty much in terms of praxis. I mean, they're like approach to praxis and what they think the purpose of Christianity is. They're probably the Protestants that are closest, although they're still way off to the Orthodox. Okay. You know, Pentecostals are all about the practice of the Holy Spirit entering. Now they can get into some really weird, it goes out into some weird spaces, but they're the Protestants that are the most concerned with like, no, what we're trying to do is get the Holy Spirit in, right? Um, he was the one, I was, it was watching something from him and it goes right to your point of what you're saying, that he said, and it shocked me. And the fact that it shocked me was the most profound thing. Was he was like, go read the Gospels. Jesus' entire ministry is healing the sick and casting out demons. And I was like, what? He said that and like, inside me, I was like, no, no. That, my initial response, right? Having been like, I'm baptized Catholic. I'm raised in the uh, Anglican church and the Episcopal church. And then like, you know, in my teen years, I'm a, a evangelical. That's what like my stepmother and my father you know, Rick Warren's church, Saddleback, right? So mega church, that type of typical mm-hmm. American evangelical, political, right? And so yes. um, I was like, the fact, that I, the fact that he said that, I was like, can he get away with that? And in my mind, I was like, have you ever read a full, a, the gospel all the way through? Like a gospel, have you ever read it all the way through? As I was saying this to myself as I'm like playing this mm-hmm. out in my head, as I'm triggered by him saying this. And I was like, oh, I haven't. Whoa. It's like, man, you can quote verses. You, you've analyzed them. You can break them down. You know the theology behind them. You know how they're tied into the Old Testament and all of this. And it's like, but you've never actually read the story? That seems crazy. What's going on? Yeah. And nobody ever told you to go and read the story. Right? And I was like, oh, that shook me to my core, shook me. And I was like, well, because it's written as a story. Like it's not written as a series of, it's not Confucius. Yeah, the, con- the context is very important as, as one story leads to the next. In a narrative, right? Mm-hmm. Like how do you, what, 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 is there any other important, like would you consume the Lord of the Rings like that? Like, is there any, like, is there any, would it make sense? Would it make sense? It wouldn't even make sense. And I was like, oh, and then I read, I started reading the gospels. I start with Matthew and I read and I'm like, oh, this dude's an exorcist. He's an exorcist and, Mm. uh, and, and heals by uh, putting on of hands. And that's why everybody's coming to him. That's his, that's why they want him around. That's why they're seeking him out. That's what they're asking him to do. Please heal my son. Please, people who are not Jews, that's why they're coming to him. And that, that was profound. When I was like, oh, oh, it's a world of spirits. Like, this is a religion of, that the, the presupposition, the foundational axiom is that we are a house of spirits. The story of Jesus makes no sense 
His entire ministry makes no sense if that is not your worldview. It, it can't. The gospel can't make sense. It presupposes that. Even to the Jews questioning him, they don't question the fact that we are a house of spirits. Because even when they're like, he's casting out spirits in the name of Satan, right? He's casting out, and, and he says a house divided against itself cannot stand, the whole thing. Even those criticizing him, their presupposition was that we were a house of spirits. Right, so now this gets back to your question about why is orthodoxy a different religion? Because the, the, one of the most important aspects of orthodoxy, and it's what other Christian, if you want to call them Christian, denominations have abandoned, and I've actually just had a conversation with somebody about this, like a text conversation, is tradition, holy tradition. So the Nicene Creed, um, you know, there's the, the section of, you know, it's what I believe, it's the profession of faith, and, um, you know, one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So the idea about, like, what is the church is that it's, it's, it's holy, okay, mm -hmm. it's Catholic, it's Catholic, meaning universal, that's what Catholic means. So it's like right. for, for the world, for the entire world, it's not tribal, as opposed to like, which would be Judaism. So it makes it different in that way, right? That it's not, it's for everybody. So one, there's but one, mm -hmm. only one, holy, Catholic, and the third part's real important as a heuristic, apostolic, meaning that there's apostolic succession. So that if I'm talking to a priest, that priest can show me a lineage that he was ordained by a bishop who was ordained by a bishop who was ordained by a bishop, and they could take it all the way back to the apostles. And the Russian priest can actually do this. Like I just, uh, the Russian priest who left here, um, he left me one book from a, a pretty famous Russian, re recent Russian priest who will probably be, uh, probably be canonized at some time, Sasoyev. And he's got one book where in the back, he's got his entire lineage of apostolic succession. Really? I forget which apostle it goes back to, right? Yeah. And what does that mean? So it means that an apostle chose to ordain this person, right? And mm -hmm. someone chosen by that apostle personally, known and chosen to be ordained the next one and the next, and the next, and the next, and the next. And that the entire goal is to not change. That's, this is what orthodoxy means. Like, when the faith is passed, what's being passed is the ancient faith. So what's being said is, we're not changing. Like, the idea is to not change. Not to add an innovation, nothing novel. It's like, so, you know, what I told this individual was that they were like, they, they said something like, you know, the, these things like the veneration of icons and all of this that, that they said that was introduced into the Catholic church and then adopted by the Orthodox church. And I was like, man, and he's a Christian. Hmm. And I was like, man, like, we don't even have to get in. You could just go read like an atheist uh, historian so that you could understand like just w how what you said is wild because i told him like look man the if you go to an orthodox church now like pick an orthodox church near you it'll be russian it'll be greek it'll be whatever and you go in the liturgy as it's laid out as it's th that's done what you're going to experience is the divine liturgy of saint john chrysostom like 99.9% .9 of the time there are some occasions where it would be saint basil right? But it's going to be the, the divine liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. Okay. St. John Chrysostom died in the year 407. Wow. He was, he was the patriarch of Constantinople. So meaning he was presiding over the Hagia Sophia, which was the center of Christian worship at the time in Istanbul. It's still there, right? Uh, at, at the time, Constantinople. So in 407, when he died, the liturgy that you experience in an Orthodox church today is the same. 
it's the same liturgy that would have been experienced in the year 400 by a Christian walking into the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. So when you say liturgy, you're talking about the the prayers, the ritual, the music, the, ri- the, the ritual, everything, everything, everything is identical. There's wow. there's been there's been changes because um, as so there's sections where there are specific like if we're commemorating a specific saint uh, on that on that day, well, which mm-hmm. you're always commemorating a. Sometimes it's not a specific saint; it's an event or whatever. But you're commemorating something, and so there are specific hymns, Troparia and Kantakia, that are like in there for that saint. And so some of these saints are after the year 400, obviously. So like they have Troparia and Kantakia to them that we're after, right? But the layout of what's in there is unchanged. So. So this, and I think that this helps to like expand an understanding of like, to say, well, could you get it from the outside? And it's like, well, hmm. it's not about, it's, it's completely experiential because like it, it is the sacraments, like the sacraments that are there, the purpose of them is to clean the vessel and to also enable the Holy spirit to come in. Right. So it's about a practice of transforming the individual, but in order to transform the individual, like that's like saying, could you, can you forge, could you like forge steel or could you like make a steel sword without ever putting the materials in the forge, like from the outside? Like, could you read, how many books would you have to read about making swords such that a sword would be created in front of you? Right. You're miss- missing ingredients. You're missing uh, elements. Pro- yeah. No, you're missing practice. Um, environment. Yeah. Praxis. The actual yeah. practice of making the sword. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, you know, they say you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. Yeah. It's that it doesn't matter how many books you read or podcasts you listen to or speeches you listen to about making an omelet. Like that's not how an omelet is made. (laughs) Like it can help you to make an omelet, but, but you could also, and there are Orthodox saints who this is the case, who never went to church. St. Mary of Egypt, who's the patron of, Mm -hmm. uh, by father turbo, my spiritual fathers of, of his, uh, his parish. And so then it's like the patron of, our little mini mission that's not an official mission here, right? Of us faithful who do, you know, the reader services and the things that we can do here with that with, when we don't have a priest. Um, she never attended church. She never read the scripture. It's in her, it's in the light, it in, says it specifically. She says it specifically. She never read the scripture nor ever had it read to her. But in her, in the life of St. Mary of Egypt, she quotes the scriptures to the monk that finds her naked in the desert where she's been for decades fasting, praying after having an experience um, visiting the, a a relic in, uh, in Jerusalem. And she's like a, she's a wanton woman up to that point. Right. She basically gets to, she decides she's going to Jerusalem because she thinks it'll be fun to be on the boat and sleep with all the young guys that are on the boat. That's why she goes to Jerusalem. Like that tells you how wicked, Mm -hmm. how bad she is. Right. So, she never went to church. So that's when people are like, well, could you do it without being like, without going to Orthodox church or whatever? It's like, well, you could. Clearly you can, but like, you're going to have to have an experience first that drives you into a desert where you will live without seeing another soul for decades and simply just pray and deal with the demons that'll be there and fast, you know, your entire life. Like, you could. So it's basically like a message to be like, you can. But that's not the question that you're asking, right? <laughs> yeah, there's 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 different practices. One is much much more uh, right, <laughs> much more useful and easy to follow. Well, uh, I, but look, it goes back to it goes back to the carpentry thing, or it goes back to the professional idea. You know, mm-hmm. it's like why do you go to a trade school? Could you could you learn to be a master carpenter by just trial and error? Yes. Yeah. Right. Like, could you learn to be a competent carpenter by trial and error? Sure. And there are people who have. 
right? That, that it's like, yeah, they're kind of raised in the wilderness. They learn a few things from their, their parents. They're very rural. It's like, wow, I built this shed when I was a kid and then I moved on and I did this. There's people who learn, you know, how to fix cars that way. And all, like you can, but why do we have trade schools? Why do we have a, why do we systematize things? Well, because you can scale it because not everybody is of the personality that, that they're going to, or the, the mindset or the, maybe even the intelligence level that they're going to be able to figure it out on their own. Mm -hmm. You know, so the people who can do, you know, but even those people, you know, you take a musician who's learned to play by ear and it's like, and I've known many of these people from my, you know, my time in the music industry that it's like, you take a, a musician who's pretty good playing by ear and then you send them off to like real music school. And then you see what they sound like when they come back. It's like, whoa, you know, like as you compare them to the other graduates, like the people who came in and just started with music school and they're blowing them out of the water. Right. Mm -hmm. And they, they were already, they're better. They were better playing by ear than those people are when they graduate from music school. Right. But you take the person who learned to play by ear and then you give them. So it's like you take an already very spiritual person and then you give them orthodox give praxis. Them practice, yeah. Boom, level up. That's fascinating. I hope that answers the question. It it does. I mean, yeah, it's it's uh, it's something I'm wrestling with on uh, you know, on my own my own journey here. So what what uh, I would what I would say is is this, and I think that this can maybe. It can help. It can certainly help Catholics, right? So something with Catholics is like, they might feel like, oh, I don't know, is this heretical or whatever? And it's like, Catholics should know that everything that the Orthodox are, are doing is a part of their tradition, right? So even down to the fact that like the Catholic Church will accept the Orthodox sacraments, baptism, all of that. So like mm -hmm. an Orthodox can go into a Catholic Church and, and take communion. Right. The only thing is that it's like the, the primacy of the Pope, but it's just yeah. that's never just like it's just not even a part of orthodoxy. So it's not, you know, there's some other things, filioque and some, but they're they're minor. That's not part of the practice. So it's like Catholics can do the Jesus prayer. Catholics can, you know, if a Catholic gets a, a orthodox prayer book and they're going to do the prayer from out of that, no problem. You know, I think for Protestants, the, the hang ups are going to be like the icons. Right. The hang hangups are going to be the icons. Um, but one thing to understand is that that was a part of the practice that was removed. So it's it's weird to where it's like, well, where do you want to go back to? You know what I mean? Like how how far how far back these people in the Reformation, right? Maybe take some time and think about how much knowledge they would have about the past, about his about the history of mm -hmm. Christianity. And then, like, by them saying no icons, like, and no veneration of the saints, it's like, well, how far back do you, well, how far back are you going? You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. that's been a part of every Christian was doing this in the year 400, 500, 600, 7, every Christian. So it's like, how far back are you qualified? Like, under what? To remove this and say, this is not appropriate. This is not how original Christians were behaving. It's like, where does your qualification? Do you have apostolic mm. succession? Where does your qualification for saying this isn't? Because the people who actually can trace their lineage by name back to the apostles are saying yes. So like, where's your, where's your qualification to say no? That's always just a weird one for me. Like I'm yeah, like, it's interesting, and it's honestly, it's something that I, I've not, you know, as it, I, I was raised a Presbyterian, mm -hmm. and then my wife and I got married in an Anglican church, and actually, mm -hmm. it was in the Anglican church where that was the first time that, you know, I, I grew up learning about the Holy Spirit, but not as, you know, uh, the Holy Spirit was something that would come over you. Um, mm -hmm. It was in the Anglican church where, you know, that we would pray for the Holy Spirit to uh, to, to to come into us. And that was, I mean, that was the first time I was exposed to that, 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 that blew my mind. I, I didn't know, <laughs> didn't know what was happening. There's an um, interesting, like something that would be worth 
reading. I think it's worth reading for anybody who's sort of on this journey. This was given to me, um, actually recently presented to me, but it, it showed up again in another conversation that I was having interest, interestingly. So I guess it was meant to, meant to show up, hmm. uh, just like as a side note in, in an, uh, uh, Wikipedia article is a, it's a document called Didache, which is D-I-D-A-C-H-E. And this is considered, like it's not even argued that this is an official catechism um, sort of breakdown. And it's considered to be the, the oldest that we know of. And it's from like second to third century. And the Orthodox Church for sure, and I think, Probably the Catholic Church, if pressed on it, would be like, yeah, this is what pretty much what the apostles would have been teaching, like in terms of their catechism of teaching the faith. It's only like 12 pages long. Um, but it's 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 pretty profound because mm -hmm. if you read it, even me, I was like, whoa, like even how things are prioritized, some of the concepts. So there's, it starts with what's called the doctrine of the two ways, the way of life and the way of death. And it's like, what is this? So it's like, this is what all the early Christians, the first things that they read or were being taught, they couldn't read a lot of them, were being taught about Christianity was, okay, there are two ways, the way of life, the way of death. What you're about to enter into is the way of life. And when you read this thing, it's like, it gives a good view of like, this is the ancient church. This is what Christians believed. This is what they practiced. And, you know, this was int introduced to me by the, the Russian priest who had showed up here and who has now been like bringing, bringing us into more knowledge about particularly the ancient faith. And he, he brought it up to say like, okay, read this, you know, and then look at our practice. And you'll see that it's like, this is it. He's like, you can, you can read this and be like, oh, that's, that's orthodox. That's what I'm practicing now. And so it's, it's, it's like, see, seeing that, if you're like, well, what's the true Christianity? To me, to me, it's like, I would just say for people to read it themselves and then be like, and look at the background of it and look at the fact that it's accepted that like, yes, this is, this is it. Like historians are like, this is the oldest we have. It's from this time period. We can trace it back. This is, this is like well-known and then be like, well, what would be the heuristic for which would be the true Christianity? And if the, if the heuristic is not, I could bring a Christian from that time to now and say to them, which one is your religion? To me, that would be the heuristic. Like if I was going to bring an apostle and be like, which one is what you do? Like bring them forward in time. Which one is what you do? The one that they would point at, I would have to say, well, that's Christianity. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that would be my heuristic for yeah. it. Right. It's like it's mm -hmm. like if somebody if somebody brings me 2000 years into the future, you know, and they're like, well, which one of these is a laptop? You know, I'd be like, yeah. uh, that's a laptop. And they'd be mm -hmm. like, OK, well, that's the one that is that's that's what a laptop was at the time that laptops were being sold. <laughs> that seems like the heuristic. Right. Yeah, so the Orthodox sense. are very obsessed with maintaining that. That's the heuristic. That's that's their heuristic. But it's like obviously, you know, it's get it's going coming to somebody with like, oh, that's the this is the real Christian. It's like just a terrible thing to do. But what I can what I can like saying, oh, this is the real Christianity, and you're not doing the real Christianity, and all of that. It's like I think that's a terrible thing to do. It's just like whether it's true or not, you know. It's it's like it would be much better for somebody to just have an experience. Yeah, I you mean, know, it's, and then just yeah, follow I, it. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm speaking from personal experience. You know, I, mm -hmm. I haven't, you know, I'm, I haven't been in the Orthodox Church, and I, I've, you know, I, I've experienced God. I've, I've experienced mm -hmm. Jesus mo moving in my life. So sure. Um, yeah, I mean, well, how could you? How could you not? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, and it's it's not. You know, that's that's. This is one thing that that 
my spiritual father has really impressed on me. And even, you know, we do this little show and we even spent a lot of, a lot uh, called the Royal path. And it, we spent a lot of time talking about it yesterday when, when we recorded our latest one that he's like, and it's actually about that. Um, it, it, it's like, of course you can experience the Holy spirit outside of orthodoxy and outside of the Orthodox church. Like, mm -hmm. of course you can, <laughs> you know, like, of, of course you could have even profound experiences. Like it's from St. Paul for crying out loud. You know what I mean? Like on the road to Damascus, he's persecuting followers of Christ. Mm -hmm. He's the exact opposite of a follower of Christ. So it's like, of course you can have an experience and feel Christ working in your life. You can be struck, you can be struck blind and hear the voice of Christ saying, why are you persecuting me? And not eat for three days and have a profound experience when you're the enemy of the apostles and all of that, right? So it's like, if you're at least pointed in the general direction, of course you can, right? Like, it's right. It says it right there, you know, like Christ didn't just heal. He didn't even just heal Jews. He, he, he healed pagans. Yeah. Like it's very, the scripture's very like, so of course, you know, it's just a matter of like, if, if, if feeling Christ moving in your life is valuable, this is sort of how I approach it, right? That if it's like, if, if you know what that feeling feels like, and if you took on a practice that increased the frequency and potency of that experience in your life. That, that was my heuristic for this is the real thing. Mm -hmm. Right. was like, Oh, when I do this, the result of my connection with Christ in so many ways is magnified in a way that is just like, it's complete. It's, it's of a complete qualitative difference than all of the things associated with like with church before. Because it was the lack of that that actually made me fall away. You know, I fell away because I was I I ran across other spiritual practices that were giving me real experiences. Now they were real experiences, some would argue, of the demonic, but at least it was a real experience. Mm. Right, you're talking about Where, like uh, hallucinogens and things. Of that not nature. even before that. Even yeah. before that. I mean, even before I got into it, was one of the things that got me into hallucinogens was I was doing like astral projection. You know, like some what is, what is magic. That? I'm not I'm not familiar. With leaving that. your body. Leaving your body. What? How does yeah? Do so that? <laughs> what? And how, how does that work? <laughs> So it's, it's uh, you know, a process of, I guess you might call it a meditative process. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I got pretty good to the, people would argue like, well, maybe you're just imagining it. Maybe it's just a dream, whatever. But ah, it was very real, you know, to where I would literally like my astral body. I could see it come out of my body and turn around and actually see my body laying on the bed, right? An out-of-body experience. Mm-hmm like to where you could be alive and have an out of body experience. And then there were things inside of it. Like there was a golden cord. If I looked or silver cord from my body to, to, to my astral body. And it was like, that had been written about. And like all of the, I was doing mm -hmm. the things that people had, you know, so it's like, this is one of those things. Lucid dreaming is another one, right? That's kind of a precursor of that where you train yourself to become conscious when, whenever you're in your dreams and then you can start doing things and controlling. And it's like, this was my entree. And so I was like, this is real. This is, I'm experiencing real things, but all the things that they're saying when I go to church is like, I can tell these people have not even had these experience, have not even had right. experiences of, how would I say it? It was something like, there, the theology that I had experienced did not account for these experiences that I was having. Does that make sense? That it's sort of like they were presenting to me, hey, we've got this worldview that encompasses everything. Right. And then I was like, 
well, I'm doing this thing. What does it say about that? Don't do that thing. Like, no, we don't even have to talk about it. Just don't we, do it. We don't talk about that thing. We, we that, that thing doesn't exist. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, no, 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 no. But I'm having the experience. And they're like, doesn't exist. And I said, ah, you don't actually have, you don't actually have a worldview that encompasses all of this. You don't have an exp you don't even know what this mm -hmm. is. So, so that's dangerous. I can't, I can't adopt if I know that there's a reality that I've experienced and seen with my own eyes and your worldview doesn't account for that reality. I can't adopt your worldview. That's a suicidal. Like just at a practical level, it's suicidal. Yeah. Right. So it's like if, if I'm in an environment and I'm like, ah, I think there's a, a lion in the grass. I see a lion. There's a something with teeth and fur, big teeth and fur. Doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. I'm looking at it. I can. It's growling. Does it, no, it doesn't exist. I'm like, y'all stay here. This is the, you're crazy people. That's what made me fall away. And then the further I went, the more experiences and the deeper and the more real they were. And so that was, th that was one of the things that like when orthodoxy found me, when Christ found me really, and then connected that, it was like, and I think that this is what people are getting from Lord of Spirits. And to some degree, the people who, who have a spiritual bent is that it's like, oh no, it encompasses all of those things. Like it, account, it accounts for ayahuasca. It accounts for psilocybin mushrooms. It accounts for DMT. It accounts for all, of course, it's like, okay, let's talk about it. Right, like, okay, here's the experience that I had, Father, uh, this thing, this thing. Any Orthodox priest would be like, okay, let's talk about it. Here's what the fathers say about this. Here's what the tradition says about this. Here's a saint's life that you can look at. Yeah, we know these. We've been dealing with these for a long time. And it's like, that's a worldview. Yeah. That's, a useful, that's a useful worldview. Like, oh, you have answers for this. And not like, not like, um, oh, I just made this up. I'm thinking about this. It's like, go read this guy. Go read this. Go read this elder. Go read this father. Right? To understand this. And it's like, and a lot of times the father will have, will have had the experience himself. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Right? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's very, that's actually very common in, so like, um, Seraphim Rose, um, Father Seraphim Rose, who a lot of people will, he's like a very popular modern, okay. he, he may become a saint or not, right? Um, wrote, a, wrote a lot, but he came, he studied under Alan Watts, right? So like he was a part of that whole thing in the Bay Area, all of that. I have no doubt that he did psychedelics and all, because all those guys did. All those guys mm -hmm. were doing it. Um, saint Sophroni, who's another modern saint, he came out of uh, Transcendental Meditation, hmm. TM. Right. So there's like, yeah. and that, and to me, that is also telling because you don't see that in any other denomination. Like you don't see the person who studied under Alan Watts, who's like, who becomes like an evangelical preacher and is fully bought in. You don't see it. Yeah. You wouldn't see uh, actually the, the, um, the brother who was on our show who people will see when 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 it's released, I guess, this week. I don't know when, uh, well, this is live, so that they'll see probably when it's released today. Um, that's what our whole conversation is about because he wasn't raised a Christian, but he became a Hare Krishna for years and is now Orthodox. And it's like, how many people who had no Christian background whatsoever, who then became a Hare Krishna, then become an evangelical? then become an Anglican, right? But this is a mm. common story for Orthodox. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's also another difference, right? Where it's like, whoa, so some, yeah. So even if you come from an Eastern and he was even talking about like all the overlap where he's like, he came in with a set of spiritual tools and he was like, oh, it was very easy. 
like the things that the spiritual tools that I had gained in the Eastern practice, it was very easy to like, it's that sort of playing by ear and then going to school, right? That when he came into orthodoxy, it was like very easy for him to fall in because he was like, oh, these are real spiritual practices happening here. This isn't mm. just talk, talk, right? There's a, there's a praxis here that's got a universality to it. Mm -hmm. I've, oh, I've experienced the spiritual world and like, oh, here it is. This is very different. Yeah, there's a, there's a realness to it. Mm -hmm. It's backed up. That's been my, I mean, that's been my experience. Um, some, some of that you uh, touched on, it's probably half hour ago now, but I made a <laughs> mental note of it to come back to it. Um, talking about the, the woke poke. I, I, I guess oh, I think yep. we were talking about, that's when we started, when I brought up the Lord of Spirits and you were talking mm -hmm. about their ancient, ancient faith r radio with uh, some of them being in favor of the woke poke. Mm -hmm. And just some of my observations on the woke poke, and um, I'm wanting to get your sort of uh, thoughts on how you sure. see things, how Vince Stradamus would uh, would see things playing out here <laughs> going sure. forward. Uh, be because, I mean, uh, my, my concern or, or th things that I see happening around me, you know, I see like, for example, someone like, like, like my sister and, and, and my brother-in-law, who who both both have very strong faith, who who both got the you know both got vaccinated, and I mean you know, I have countless examples uh, mm -hmm. like sure. that. Uh, my wife and I are are not vaccinated. Um, I know people who, you know, kind of were were very much against the vaccine and kind of got vaccinated just kind of on a mm -hmm. whim and thinking they'll be able just to, you know, it's not a big deal. It's just one it's just one shot. You know, it's not going to change mm -hmm. my life. Mm -hmm. um, how, how, how do you see this playing out? The way that I, I guess I'll say my piece first here, the way that I see uh, these mandates or the vaccine playing out is it's really not about the vaccine per se. And even if it, you know, even if someone does take the vaccine, it's going to be the, the next shot or, or the next, uh, the next mandate um, as that wall gets built up. And um, part of my question is, you know, what is, how do you see, what would be your guess on that time um, to forecast how long it's going to take that wall to get built up or that water to rise uh, to the level um, th that we're going to need that arc? Um, is this something where, you know, as, you know, people like, like myself and others who, who are, um, you know, not taking the woke poke and not taking whatever comes next and not taking whatever comes next, um, is do you think this is six months away or ten years away? Yeah. So I will. I will. Since 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 I've gone, you know, on to uh, the right, or, right on time. Here's here's Mark Claire. Get your shit and go. Yeah. <laughs> since 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 I have. Um, you know, been spending a lot of time on the orthodox thing. Let me answer your let me answer your question in a materialist in a materialist bent, which is not which is not contradictory, right? It's not either or, it's both and. Okay, so it's like the spiritual manifests in the material, but like how how to understand this in a in sort of a practical material way. So your question is, what is the timeline? Like, is it six months or is it 10 years? And what I will say is that it's it, we have to define it, and mm -hmm. it is all it is it is done. It is a fait accompli. It is it is done. Um so it it yep. has already happened. Yes, it has already happened. And and the question is so so then it's like, what is it? Right? Mm -hmm. So you're right. So in so it's like, is this about the woke poke? And it's like, yes and no. Mm -hmm. So it's the no is it's not about this specific several formulations that are being currently injected into people's arms. And perhaps whether it's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, however many times that this particular one is going to have to go into somebody's arm. Um, it is not about that. What it is about is it is about the, let's call it not a spirit, but a framework 
a cognitive framework about how do we solve a given problem. So in, um, in software development, we would call this a design pattern. And a design pattern is something that's a level of abstraction that is above the actual code. And it's more about like, how do you think about beginning to solve a problem? How do you construct the code to solve the problem? And different design patterns, when you look at code, you can look right away and see what design pattern they're using. Because it's just, the code will be laid out that way. So I don't even need to know what the software does or look too much at the software to see what design pattern is being used. And so the it is the design pattern. And the design pattern is when there is a crisis of any kind, a medical crisis, but it doesn't even have to be a medical crisis, that the, the tools are all in place now for a level of compliance that, ha that is a positive feedback loop. So what happened was basically we introduced a design pattern of a positive feedback loop of fear combined with a global communications network and like microsecond news cycles, basically, and individualized um, propagation of information. So when this whole thing started, like in March 2020, I had tweeted out in public and I had said, listen, what's about to happen is what the Salem witch trials would have been had we had social media at that time. And the, the thing with the Salem witch trials was they could have gone on forever except for the fact that they were limited in geographical scope. So they kind of ran out of, they quickly burned them. The virus burned itself out. In mm -hmm. some ways, the mimetic virus was quarantined. It killed off enough people to the point where it could not, there was nothing else for, no one else for it to kill basically, right? But this mimetic, this mimetic disease, this mimetic pathogen that is out, is it's already out. It's completely taken over and infected. And it, it's, it's the dominant, right now it is the dominant global meme. It, it is the global culture. Like when they talk about like one world government, it's here. It's here. Because if you're like, when in human history has there ever been a time when, gl when global oh. policy was in lockstep about something like it's lockstep. In, like it's in lockstep, in lockstep down to you know uh, dictating what an individual has to ingest into their body in order to participate in, in society. And if this that's goes back to not a global government. Yeah. It like this it, goes back to what we talked about at, at the beginning um, when we're talking about th this issue with libertarians mm -hmm. and half not understanding that we're not living in 2012 with Ron Paul. We're no. living under a global government. Well, and that's why people are like, well, we need to prevent a global government. And I'm like, you actually, this is the, this is the blind spot. So, and this is, this is where, so now I got to go back to orthodoxy because this is where the orthodox worldview helps you. Mm -hmm. Right. This is, this is, uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities. That it's like the orthodox understanding of powers and principalities is like, no, it's not, it's a spirit. It's a, this is the Christian understanding. This is the kingdom. This is the principality of the, the Antichrist. That it's like, it's not the, this flag and this position and this building and this constitution. And the, this, is, this is a huge libertarian blind spot of what they think the state or the government or any of those things is. And it's like, no, the government is the system of control. The government is the social order, right? The social order enforced by violence, by men with guns. Mm -hmm. That is, you look and you're like, oh, we have that already. Because you ask like, well, what's the lockdown policy in a given country? Whoa. Like, the fact that they're like reporting lockdowns here, lockdowns here, lockdowns here. Well, how did that, who, no person, there's no person. 
and this is why this is why you have to have a different again now we get into your worldview doesn't account for this this is the real problem libertarians are having it says like your worldview doesn't account for how do how does the social order come into lockstep even in states that are opposed to one another north korea's got a lockdown china's got a lockdown us has got a lockdown Iraq's got, mm -hmm. Iran's got a lockdown. How do they come into, how do they all have the same set of values, even though they're supposed to be opposed to one another? How is this possible? Like, your worldview doesn't account for this. And so it's, <laughs> that's, the, that's the lion in the grass that you don't think exists. I can't get with your worldview. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> You're going to die. This is what I've been trying to communicate. Like, you're about to get eaten. There's a lion in the grass that you don't believe exists. I, but it's growling. Analogy, I, I forget who said this, but with that example, if someone sees, sees a threat, sees a lion, you know, sees an elephant in the room, it is the one who does not see the lion, does not see the elephant who is hallucinating. It's not the person right. who sees it. That's right. That's exactly <laughs> right. And I think that that has been, that's the meme of like, you know, the conspiracy theorist uh, with the, you know, uh, the, 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 the Django, like, uh, 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 you know what I mean? Like, uh, that's the, the, where it's like, oh, all the conspiracy theorists were right. Ron Paul was right. Mm -hmm. Like all of this, you know, like this is the meme that keeps coming up is that it's like, oh, the conspiracy theorists were right. And it's like, yeah, because you called the growling lion a conspiracy. It's the, the only thing that made them a conspiracy theorist was because, yeah, you just didn't see it. You know, maybe maybe they're colorblind. So the camouflage didn't work the same way for them. You know, mm -hmm. they've got something different about them. And you're like, no, it's not there. It's not there. It's not there. It's not there. You know, so. You know, the question of like, how long do we have? N no, it's it's already. It's already there, but this is why I've said, this is why I've said that the only people who will, it's actually, it's, I mean, this is how, this is the filter for, uh, this is the filter for Christianity. Mm -hmm. This moment is the filter for Christianity. Um, because this is the, this is the kingdom of Antichrist. Like that's what's, that's what this is. Like it, it's that's period because it's it's in the place of Christ, not against Christ, not opposite of Christ, in the place of Christ, and it's like Christ is the one who heals you, right? Christ is the one who transforms you, but like it's transhumanism, it's a biomedical surveillance state, it's all of these things, and it's like that's anti-Christ because that's supposed yeah. to be Christ's job. That's so so it, it isn't just, you know, it isn't, this didn't just come about just with COVID. Um, no. This, this has been, yeah, this has been something, as, I mean, as you've talked about, even prior to COVID, that, that's, that's been building. And uh, it's been building since the beginning of time. Yeah. Like, well, <laughs> we're talking about like these, Satan is an eternal being. Yeah. It's not like, well, when did this all start? It's like the garden, buddy. <laughs> like, you know, but, and but before it, that, <laughs> but but it seems uh, it seems it's more is it, it or maybe maybe it's just perspective. Uh, maybe it's just because it's apparent to me. It seems like it should be apparent to everyone. It's apparent because it's so apparent to you. It seems like it should be apparent to more people. Um, I wonder how how much of that plays into it, or has it become so egregious that it, it, it's a it's a wake up call for a large percent of the uh, population. It hasn't become so egregious. It's it hasn't become so egregious. Like people should really. It was eye opening for me. My godfather was like, "You should read this book." My, maybe probably of a year ago, he was like, "You should read this book. It's called Chosen Chosen for His People. It's about the last Saint Tikhon, the last patri patriarch of the uh, Russian Orthodox Church when the Bolsheviks were coming in." So a lot of a lot of people don't know this, but um, you know, hundreds of thousands of Orthodox Christian 
priests were killed by the Bolsheviks and the Soviets. Hundreds of thousands. What? Of priests. Millions of faithful. Yeah, it's hidden from the world. But it's, it's not like it's not that hidden. Like it's wow. history. It's well known. It's not a question. Like, go look it up. It's, it's there. The numbers are there. Mm -hmm. The church keeps very good records. And basically, they, they made a, a fake church with a different patriarch who was down with them and who like changed things around. But the people who remained faithful, um, they killed them. They blew up churches. They did because they're atheists. And so the, the so wait, say, say church, that again, the people who remained faithful to the new church, or? no, to the, to the, to the actual church, the new church, wasn't like the church. The new church was a, a wing of the, it was something that the Bolsheviks called the Russian Orthodox church, but it mm -hmm. was beholden to the communist party. It wasn't the church. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the same thing that the Chinese did in like Tibet, right? Yeah. They installed the Dalai Lama, you know, the, so the Soviets did that with the Russian and they killed lots of priests, hundreds of thousands of clerics. So there's different clerical levels. So like mm -hmm. patriarch, bishop, metro, you know, metropolitan bishop, priests, uh, you know, to like, presbyter, monks. There was tons of monks. They killed them. Like, and there's just these horrible stories. Some of them were eaten by rats, like terrible. And they're considered martyrs. Like they're commemorated in the church literally every day. I can go and look and see. They're called new martyrs. And see the actual names that we're commemorating today of priests and monks and whatnot that were killed by the mm -hmm. by the Bolsheviks, and so they understood at the time that they were witnessing the rise of the kingdom of Antichrist. Like they they under, they said it at the time, they understood it at the time, and that was in 1917, 18, 19, 20, into the mid twenties, thirties. They mm -hmm. were still killing them. Uh, they were as when they could find them. How much longer did that regime last? Right. So it's like if if they're killing hundreds of thousands, and it's not like it wasn't known by the people that this was happening, and the priests weren't the only ones they were killing, obviously, or in putting in gulag. Everybody knew, right? Everybody knew. That seems pretty egregious, right? Yeah. Did it that's... stop? Did it stop it? No. And as a matter of fact, generations from then, from then chose to go to work, go to school, fall in with the communist regime. This is the nature of people. And they didn't even have the level of control. They didn't even have the level of propaganda. It's not like they could reach most of the Russian population on a radio or a television. In 1930, the Russians? <laughs> I mean, they're living in, 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 in huts. You know what I mean? In the villages, they, they didn't have electricity for crying out loud. Still happened. Yeah. And they were devout. They were devout. Like you want to talk about devout, like they're devout religious people. So no, we've got a long way to go, but in the end, this will be, it will only be the faithful that are left. Everybody else will take it. And I'll tell you why. Like, so you want the Vince Radamus prediction? Here's the Vince Radamus prediction. Um, we we will we will get the uh, passport that will come and it'll come in it'll basically be brought in by like private companies. When you see Walmart do it, you should know that we've hit the new phase. But they will for their customers. We're we're just not quite. It's going to take a little while on the rollout, and it'll probably go along with the CBDC. We've got all of those things. But the most important point is going to be that the next poke, so not of this one, this one will happen and then it will go away for a little while and then maybe a year or two or three, and then something new will come that will require a, a, some therapy. It might not even be the poke anymore because they're already talking about daily pills. They're already talking about dermal patches. I saw that one yesterday. Talking about a, uh, a nasal spray. I saw nasal that. spray. Yeah. Um, but they, they're going to need to be like trackable in all of this. So they'll figure that mm -hmm. out. But whatever the next thing is will be a lot less acutely dangerous. So right now, you know, we're seeing this pericarditis and the myocarditis and there's enough reports of it that even if it's rare everybody's hearing them right so it's like 
and rare, whatever. Like still, would I risk my child's life with that? Absolutely not, heck, right? Heck no. But, yeah. but even if they're arguably rare, people are hearing them. You need to know this is just the first iteration of a regime. Like, of course, the look, the first this cars a, were dangerous. This, the first trains a, were dangerous. This is a test run. It's a test run. That's mm -hmm. what people need to understand. That like, if your argument against taking it is because it's dangerous, you've already lost. Right? Mm. So everybody whose argument against it is that it's acute, it's got an acute danger. Well, they're necessarily saying that they would take it if it didn't have an acute danger. So all they have to do to get those people to fall in line is just make a safer one that doesn't have an acute danger. Those people are those. So those people are gone. Because, because it's, it's not the I think I'm following you, following you uh, along here. It's not the actual, it, it's just compliance. That's right. Right. That's all that matters is being that's compliant. It. And they don't track, tracking, they don't care about tracking, yes. tracking compliance. Tra the tracking of compliance. That's the panopticon. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's just a, like I've, I've said, it's a baptism. It's a ritual. It's just a ritual. Like it, 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 to some degree, it's actually important. And we're seeing this now with the children. Um, in this initial going, it's actually important that there is some danger. So the, the, so the danger is a piece of it because it identifies the true believers. It allows for social cohesion. I'm risking for, for my God, which is Satan, right? The prince of this world. That's who, they're, that's who they're sacrificing to. And it's not the first time that they've sacrificed children to, uh, to a demon, to a God. I mean, that's, that's Baal. That's Moloch, right? I Child sacrifice. I I saw your Twitter post that, yeah. That's, child uh, sacrifice is, is, is like the fact that we haven't had child sacrifice, in, that we don't know that. It's like, no, you have to understand for most of human civilization, child sacrifice was a means of social cohesion. Mm -hmm. You sacrifice the thing that is the most dear to you. You know, that's, that's you, sacrificing, sacrificing the things of value. I mean, you even go into the Old Testament and it's like, the prophets, like I, I was, what was I reading? Um, Micah. So you go and read the book of Micah, right? And there's a specific section in there where God is angry. And he's like, how are you bringing me lame animals, blind animals? No, that's the garbage. You bring me the valuable things, right? Yeah. That's, that's not a real sacrifice. If you bring me the blind one, that's not a sacrifice. He wanted the best. Yeah. That's a sacrifice, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, it's not a big leap. You know, why do there have to be prohibitions against child sacrifice to the Israelites? Like, why do they specifically have to be told, don't sacrifice your children? Don't do like those people with Baal. Don't sacrifice your children. Why do they have to be told that? Because if you don't tell them that, it's a very short cognitive leap. If mm -hmm. you don't specifically tell them that, it's a very short cognitive leap from sacrifice your, your best livestock to sacrifice your children. Very short. Mm -hmm. And so like, it's very, and, and you see this, look at how these, you know, these things have come up and like, people will like troll them and laugh at them. But I look at it and I'm like, oh, that's the pattern. To where they'll be like, well, m you know, my child did get this pericarditis or whatever. And yeah, I have to pay the medical bills, but my next child, I'm definitely vaccinating as well. My yeah, other children will be vaccinated. But it's not. See, you got to get out of that. You got to get out of that. Because if, you, if, if it's unbelievable to you, you don't understand what human beings yeah. are. You don't actually mm. understand human history if it's unbelievable. It should be imminently believable mm. you should be like i know exactly where we are mm. especially as a christian mm. if child sacrifice is not a thing why over and over in the old testament are there are there prohibitions against child sacrifice no you you're right you're right this is this is what this is what's happening
Yeah. This I is mean, what people was, have to understand. It was human beings um, who were, you know, with the Nazis who were putting putting Jews in gas chambers. That I That's mean, it. human beings just like today. <laughs> they were no different. And and that was a sacrifice that they were making to a greater order. The idea there was we have to sacrifice human beings to a greater order. But it still is a lower, like sacrificing your enemies is still much lower than sacrificing the first of the, of the flock. Like it's a much lower order of devotion to sacrifice, you know, to make mm -hmm. turn your enemies into a sacrifice. That's a much lower order of devotion. The highest level of devotion is sacrifice those things which are most valuable to you. And that's going to be your children. And so people need to understand that it's like this pattern is a totally familiar pattern. The trick, the trick is that the materialist worldview doesn't account for it. It says that this was just the domain of superstitious, primitive people. It doesn't give the devil his due. Because then they're like, well, we're not superstitious. Well, we're doing the same thing. But it, we can't possibly be worshiping a god. And it's like, well, if there was, if, if there was a, 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 a deity that wanted you to do the sacrifice... But like, isn't it very like if this is a wicked deity, like, of course, it wants you to believe that you're not sacrificing to a, to to it. Mm -hmm. Like, isn't that isn't that a isn't that the, a con? Like, doesn't a human being do that? Like, isn't that the Nigerian prince scam? <laughs> right. Like yeah. what it wants from you is your devotion. But it actually doesn't matter whether or not, you know. Like the demons don't, they just want rights. You don't have to say their name. You don't have to know what you're doing. Like what, where does the prohibition against Ouija boards and things like that come in? Like don't, you're doing a ritual right now. And now the ritual doesn't look like uh, what it looked like 5,000 years ago, but the demons don't operate that way. They operate on patterns, abstract, the design pattern, like I said. You're like, but the code doesn't look the same. And I'm like, we're not talking about the actual code. We're talking about the design pattern. If what you're looking for is the actual code, it's like, look, the actual code for Facebook and the actual code for this stream yard that we're using are different. Right. But I guarantee you they're using similar design patterns. And if you're just like, well, this can't possibly be the same thing. This can't possibly be computer uh, code. This can't possibly be, because look, it's different. It's like, man, you don't even understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this. I mean, this kind of brings brings me to the next the next thing I wanted to talk to you about ties mm -hmm. right into it. Go for it. And kind of. I mean, I, I already know what your answer is going to be, but I, I still <laughs> want to bring it up. <laughs> but, because I think it's important for to drive this okay. home because th there, there is a segment and this is just going to be the we'll, we'll wrap it up after this. I, okay, cool. Yeah, I've yeah. taken I've capitalized too much of your time. Oh, it's been it's been I've been I've enjoyed it. It's been great. I, I appreciate that um, because there there is a a segment of uh, this you know post libertarian group uh, these types of people who think uh, we can we can escape uh, to Florida or to Texas or um, and, and that can be maybe a part of building the ark. We already talked on building the ark, so we don't need to go back to that. Mm -hmm. But um, you, you sent a tweet out, I think it was in July, where uh, the wording was, Florida will be handed to the Church of Woke by DeSantis himself, and Texas mm -hmm. will be brought to the prince of this world by Governor McConaughey. Mm -hmm. So the floor is yours. So so yeah, this, this escape thing, I think people also... Uh, in some ways, misunderstand my move to Saipan. This was another thing that came up in the sort of the, the, that row uh, with with Dave Smith was, 
you know, R- running people, away, running away yeah, to Saipan, I think yeah. running, running away to Saipan. And it's, you know, it, it does have to do with build the art. There's a great, uh, so people who haven't read Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance by Robert Piercig, read it. It's, su- it's such a great book. And I read it when I was actually, I worked for a time, you know, to make extra money while I was uh, DJing in my twenties and, and throwing parties as a motorcycle courier. So it was actually great because I was working on my bike at the time. And also there's great things about motorcycles in there, but he's mm-hmm. u- really using the motorcycle and the maintenance of a motorcycle talking about value and quality. It's a great philosophy book, but just brilliant. One of these classic books, but he says, you know, there's three things that you need to effectively be able to solve a problem. He's talking about fixing your motorcycle. But th- it's obviously a metaphor for any problem. Mm-hmm. He says, so there's three things that you need. He says, you need an adequate source of light, right? So that you can see the problem. And anybody who's ever tried to do, to fix anything where they couldn't actually see it, imagine doing some plumbing, electrical, trying yeah. to fix your car at night, change a tire at night with no light, right? That's why people kid, who are- Have your kid holding the flashlight and they're holding it in your eye. and <laughs> Right. And so you, this is like very practical, but very true, yeah. right? So he says, you have to have light to be able to see it. Basically, what he's saying is you have to have a clear view of the problem. It can't be obscured, mm-hmm. right? Clear view of the problem. Then he says, you have to have a sustainable, you have to be in a sustainable position. So basically, you have to be able to uh, be in a position where you can work on the problem without basically your body giving out, right? And this is like obvious to a mechanic, right? Why do they have a lift? Why, why, is, yeah. why are there so many things that are going to put it in a comfortable position and not like you're, anybody who's ever tried to like, oh, uh, you know, do something and they're in a little thing and they're, oh, my neck is giving out and oh, I can't do this. Even your work, right? You're doing, you're, you're in the office, you need a chair, mm-hmm. right? That's going to be like ergonomic. Why is an ergonomic chair so expensive? Because it's valuable right. because it allows you to work for longer, right? So he says, that's the second thing. You need a position that's there. And then he says, you need the right tool for the job. The right tool. It's got to be the right tool for for the job. And anybody knows like the difference between like, uh, you know, some like adjustable wrench and a socket or even a pneumatic socket, right? Mm -hmm. Adjustable wrench is one thing. Socket is one thing. But when you get that pneumatic and you're like, boom, boom and it's off (laughs) like you're like oh that pneumatic was worth it (laughs) it was worth all the thousands of dollars that i spent for the compressor and all the oh this is glorious anybody who likes working on cars or anything like that knows what a difference that makes right so those are the three things and it's like you know people are like oh escape to saipan it's like it wasn't about escaping to saipan i was in southern california There were lockdowns happening. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a small office there. I was in like San Bernardino area, actually very close to where Max is to eat and go to the little park and and all of this very beautiful that I could spend my day, right? And think, and I was very productive in this little office. And then the lockdowns happened. And like that office shut down. You know, I'm working from home. I can't go out. I can't go and the gym shuts down. The gym had been my life, right? It was like, wake up. For so many years, it was. I wake up before everybody wakes up. I would go. It still is not dark out. I go to the gym. I get my workout. Then I go and I go to the coffee shop where I would usually write. I would write. Then I would go go to my office, which was walking distance away. And then I would get to work, you know? And it was just like, that was my routine. It was spiritually. And it was like, I couldn't go to my office anymore. The coffee shop was only doing takeout orders. The gym closed down. You know, it was like, okay, well, this is not the position. This is not the, like, of those three things, like the position where I can work. I was like, I can't do the work that I need to do. Which is, which is what? It's work on Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, I I literally maintain a Bitcoin full node for Bitcoin Cash and eCash. Like, th- that's what I do. 
I'm the sole maintainer of that, right? And it's like, so if people are like, Bitcoin's the way to freedom. It's like, do you want, would you prefer me to be in a place where I could work comfortably all day? Me. Does that lead more to freedom? Or does me being in California, where I'm too stressed out, having all of these, it's, I'm in a creative field mm -hmm. where I can work like one hour a day where I'm in a bad position. Which, which one is the fight, guys? Which one is the running away and which one is running to the fight? Right? That's, yeah. that's, that's what you got to go with. Okay? And so it's like here, and it's not just me. An another, uh, another guy showed up here, um, Tim, and he's a podcaster, drummer, artist, great guy. And literally yesterday, he said the same thing to me. He came from Colorado. And he was like, man... I feel so low stress. I'm able to work more hours than I've ever worked. I'm actually making more money than I ever have. My relationship is better. Like he, he came with his, his wife. My relationship is better. Like everything, he's like, man, I'm able to work more. So it was like, no, I want to, the move that I'm making is so I can work more. Right? That's People the move that I'm making. <laughs> and because and because you had you have clarity on your art What's on the what you're supposed to be working on right so you were able and to so calibrate so, yourself yes. to it, it was clear to you quickly what you needed to do and i think that's the problem with with, with a lot of people is they don't have th that clarity they're lacking what they need to do what their contribution needs to be what their life needs to be um to build the art. And th this and this is why the escape thing it, it hasn't just been Florida. It hasn't just been Texas. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean it's so many places like I you know I'm seeing people in my circle talking about well what about Georgia? What about Serbia? What about this place and this place and it's all about es this escape, you know? And it's like listen you may be jumping, and this is what I've, I've also tweeted recently, like you may be jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire mm. if your move is escape. Because it's like, there is no escape. Okay? This is a global phenomenon. You cannot escape. What you can do is you can find a firing position. Like, if, if I'm like, I've got my sniper rifle, Here's, you know, my squad here on the ground in a firefight. And I'm like, I'm going up to that bell tower. You know, I, I take off. It's like, is he retreating? No, he's going up into the bell tower. So that he's got a better firing position so that he can fight with you. Like the sniper doesn't yeah. fight in, in the line. The sniper is fighting from elsewhere. Why? Because that's the best position for him for him to fight from mm -hmm. his, his weapon, his tool is most effective there. It's not most effective down there. He's not escaping. He's not, there is no position to escape to. There's only a position to fight from. And so like what I've been telling people is like, it's not about the place. It's about the people. That's what I see missing from out of the conversation. And that I, was I think, what, I think what you just said there talking about there is no escape. It's about finding your place to fight from. If people just take that away from this podcast, I, I mean that's that's so much clarity. I think I think that was missing. At least for me. Maybe other people got that. I don't know. Well, I mean, it was probably missing from, you know, my expression of sort of my my own. You know, I mean, look, there was the get your shit, there was the get your shit and go comment, right? But I think what's missing from out of that is, you know, we all take for granted our own sort of makeup, mm -hmm. right? My makeup just doesn't have in it to be out of the fight. And I think that maybe I take it for granted that people know that about me. Or maybe I take it for granted that people understand that that's like baked in to my, like, like I'm all in. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that people who have been following me, maybe they get the sense of that, that like, this is what I'm going to be doing my entire life. You know what I mean? Like the journey that I've been on has been like this, this is it for me. You know, like I've, I've found a path and obviously it will evolve and whatever, but it's like, this is, this gives me meaning in a way, like trying to help and to build the tools that can help people and not even help, help myself, you know, help myself, help my family right. um, to survive through this. But one of the things that I look, it's completely selfish, right? Because Someday I'm not going to be here. And this can't be done alone. And I've got kids. Mm -hmm. Like it's insufficient for me to like, that's the whole, like when people try to assign to me as though I'm part of the, like, just get rich, bro. Just get money, bro group. I'm like, that's insufficient. That's insufficient before I can, before, like, it's incumbent upon me to work as hard as I can to, to, to fulfill God's will because like it has been aligned with protecting my family, right? Like when I, when I have led a life of prayer, allowed the Holy Spirit to guide me, the result has been pr the protection of my family in a way that I couldn't have imagined, like in ways that I couldn't have thought myself to. And so it's like, oh, and of course it is, <laughs> right? Like, Oh, how could it not? Like, well, of course it is. Like, <laughs> protecting it, being a good father is part of, like, it's, yes, that's righteous. Like, that's supposed to happen. Absolutely. Right? So, so I, I have a responsibility to, 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 to build and to help others because those are the others who are going to help my people. Like, I, that's, that's it. That's I'm all in on that. There's not like, because what else is <laughs> like, there isn't some other more grand mission than that. Mm -hmm. Like the, the mission is take care of my children, take care of my family. That happens when your incentives are aligned and you understand what that means. That also happens to mean being a person of value to your community. That also happens to mean like, Supporting, supporting those who are on the same path, supporting those who will, who, if you are gone, if you are not around, would take your children on as their own the same way that you would for them. Mm -hmm. Developing that, we that web of mutual respect and trust is the most selfish thing that you could possibly do. And that's what I'm dedicated to for my whole life. And it's like, there's no escape. <laughs> We're in it. Like the kingdom of Antichrist is here. It's here. It's here. It's upon us. Right? So it's like that's build. So then build the ark, man. That's it. Yeah, and, Become and, and the it vessel. Gets, and when it gets to Matthew McConaughey or Ron DeSantis or the rock running for president, which I think very well could happen. I don't know if it'll be, mm -hmm. you know, in 2024, but um, I, I think I think he's, he's in line here. Mm -hmm. These are just... You know, next in line to uh, to continue down this path of mm -hmm. of uh, initiating this uh, this compliance. Um, the die is cast, man. Yeah. And what people have to understand is like it's going to be. People have talked about the Amish, but they don't really think about the Amish, right? That it's like at the time when the Amish stopped complying. At the time when the Amish said, this is not part of the kingdom, every single person lived like the Amish lived now. That's worth considering. That is worth considering. And I, I just watched a quick little uh, thing about the Amish and how they dealt with COVID. And they've, they've had their best, their best year ever this year because <laughs> everyone got COVID and they just kept going. And they're, they're living normal, normal, normal Amish life. Nothing has, nothing has changed for them. And so. so what I think people should keep in mind is that the, there are these periods. Like the Amish are an example of a particular pattern. Mm -hmm. When a group of people decide, stop. Like it's a fork, really. 
You know, the Amish have a we will not advance our technology thing, but there are many that have not had that and they've been a fork. And the pilgrims that came to America were a fork in that same mm -hmm. way, right? That it's like, we've seen this many times. And so what people have to understand is who, like, yes, all of those things will happen, but I think, at least for me, mentally and in my heart, I'm already forked. I'm already forked off. Like, what that, what's going on there is a different country, kingdom, culture from me, right? Now I'm just now I'm just looking to to help to okay, who are the others who are actually and it's it's hard right now. You can't tell who's actually in your in that in the forked kingdom and who's just who just needs a better who just needs more prodding to join the kingdom of antichrist. I think that's about 99% of the people who are anti whatever. Cuz if they're anti it because it's democrats or liberals or progressives, they will be in as soon as they provide them with the the red option. Maybe it'll be the next Trump run. They're in. Well, this, yeah, I mean, right? if, you, if, you, if you look back, this this really was the red option. It started mm -hmm. as the red option, and mm -hmm. the blue the blues didn't like it. And mm -hmm. then the blues got power, and then it became the blue option and not the red option. So that tells so, you everything. If it's yeah. the people who are against it for the health reasons, Mm -hmm. All you got to do is give them one that doesn't have the acute to where they can't yeah. be like, well, it seems like it's safe. I've got I've got people around me who are like that, who are who are like libertarians, whatever. They're not poked at the moment. But I see the we have conversations and I see the things going in their head, you know, and it's like, man, if this thing was safe, if I couldn't show you that you're that you actually have a chance of like heart problems, you would have already got, got it because oh, I, well, I need to be able to fly. I want to be able to go to this thing. I don't see what's the big deal. It's safe. I mean, what's the, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So the only people who will be left are the equivalent of the Amish. And the only reason that you would do that is if you truly believe that this was the antichrist, which means that you actually have to truly believe that such a thing as antichrist exists. Yeah. How many, and, how many and of those are there? And putting yourself in a position, um, in, in a fighting position, because sure. I, I, if if you don't, you probably won't be able to avoid. You'll get steamrolled, probably. Mm -hmm. um, yep. It's no, agreed. Agreed. Oh, this this has been. I mean, this has been huge for me. I mean, this this. I mean, a, a lot of. Uh, and maybe it's just being able to engage. You know, sometimes you're listening to a podcast and I'm sure you've said these things and you know, when you listen to a three hour long podcast, know. some things, <laughs> you, you don't, you don't get everything, but, uh, this was, uh, this was awesome. And I thank you for your time and, and please, uh, take some time here and, uh, plug whatever you need to plug, what you're, uh, what you're working on, uh, Bitcoin mystery school, all that good stuff. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. I never do that. I mean, I guess people could check me out on, on Twitter. Uh, it's at Cyprianus, uh, Cyprian and then O, uh, U S yeah. Bitcoin mystery school.com is monthly and it's, um, People really enjoy it. I think one of the big value adds of it is it's created quite the community. We have like hundreds of students who have taken the course. It's only 20 people per, per month, but it is completely different than whether you think you know what Bitcoin is or whether you have no idea. If things in this conversation have been interesting to you, then you would probably enjoy this course. Um, it is, uh, it's, it's been it's definitely been a, a, a labor of love and a passion project and something that was sort of revealed to me to do. And I think that it's been very positive. And again, like the community of people that's around, we have private telegram groups and all of that. It's it's great. So even if you're looking for a community of like minded people, it's like come for the community and stay for the Bitcoin. I guarantee you, you'll be blown away and have your sort of and and the other thing that it's if I could just say, because I don't think that I've said this, but it's been something that's emergent is if you're looking for some hope, if you're looking for some hope in terms of like tools that are there and that you can actually participate in at this point, give, give it a shot, honestly, mm -hmm. because I will tell you, it's something that has given me hope, a great deal of hope, because I see that, that there are, this is one of many tools but an incredibly powerful and clearly valuable tool 
that when that can be understood by anyone can be used by anyone more than just like go on Coinbase and buy some. It's not about that. It's not about trading. It's not about any of that. It's about how this can actually be part of you building the ark, how, how this can actually be sort of a, a refuge in the storm for those of us who are going to be the remnant on this thing. So yeah, bitcoinmysteryschool.com is where you can check that out. Yeah, it was, I mean, I took it, what was that, two months ago, a bunch, bunch mm -hmm. of us from Lines of Liberty yep. and in the Pride. Yeah, it was, I mean, it, it was mind-blowing mind and not not what I expected, really, in, in a good way. Mm -hmm. um, good, good, so good. So I, I highly, highly recommend it. Thank you, John. So that's that's all I got. Let me figure out how to sign this off here. <laughs> and uh, Cyprian, thanks for having ben, me, man. Thank yes. you, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. It was an absolute pleasure.